usually to talk about human spaceflight, but you know what? Why limit ourselves, right? NASA has a rich and storied history. Its beginnings, people often forget, was in aviation. The NACA, or National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, laid the groundwork for how we think about a national space program. And it's more than just humans flying in the air and in space. NASA has programs that extend from our home planet to the farthest reaches of the universe. It's hard to capture everything that NASA has done since its formation, but there's a new ebook that does a pretty good job. This ebook is published on nasa.gov right now, and it's called NACA to NASA to Now, The Frontiers of Air and Space in the American Century. It came out very recently, and it captures some of the most significant moments and programs of NASA's history and puts it into one concise volume. It's a great read, full of narratives and layers that help to demonstrate how widespread NASA's efforts are. Lucky for us, we were able to chat with the book's author, Roger Launius, formerly NASA's chief historian and the associate director for collections and curatorial affairs at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Roger talks about the inspiration for writing the book and walks us through some of the key moments. Very much looking forward to this conversation. Let's get right into it. Enjoy. Roger Lanius, thank you so much for coming on Houston. We have a podcast today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. All right. A uh, wonderful book that you read. Uh, I, I got a chance to finish it earlier this week, and um, it was... It, it, it did a really good job of capturing it. I'm so happy to have you on to help to to kind of go through it. Um, but but I kind of wanted to start before we before we really dive into the book is just you know the story of you and how you got this idea and and what the the process of actually writing the book. Uh, Roger, I know you know prior to your current tenure at the uh, Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, you spent some time as NASA's chief historian. How'd you get that role? I did. Uh, so between 1990 and 2002, I was the NASA chief historian there at NASA headquarters in D.C. The uh, I had been working as a historian for the U.S. Air Force at the time. After I finished my Ph.D., I uh, took a job with the Air Force. And literally in those days, uh, I was in the personnel office at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, and I saw an advertisement for the chief historian for NASA on the bulletin board. Hmm. So I grabbed that, applied for the job, pre-internet era, you know, sent him a resume through the mail. And uh, lo and behold, I was I, I was uh, interviewed and selected for the position. <laughs> did you always have a love for history, or did it, is it something that you maybe fell into? No, no, no. History has always been my uh, my objective. I, uh, I, 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 you know, I changed my major two or three times in college, but ultimately I did a Ph.D. in history at LSU, hmm. and uh, that sort of set me on path. Was it always, uh, did you always kind of lean towards the uh, aeronautic history, or did you sort of dabble in, you know, maybe war or, or anything else? What, what, oh, you know, what was your path that sort of led you to, you know, aeronautics and space? Yeah, well, I, interestingly enough, I didn't have a particular background in uh, uh, in aerospace history at all. I uh, studied the history of the American West. Oh. And uh, so it's sort of a sideways uh, 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 turn in terms of my career. But uh, when I finished my Ph.D., I went looking for a position and found one with the U.S. Air Force, which put me on the path to study aeronautics history. didn't take very long to realize this is pretty interesting stuff. <laughs> And the same is true, obviously, with NASA and its role. Yeah, how'd you enjoy it, uh, That your time as a NASA chief historian? Oh, I loved it. Uh, it, it. It was a great experience, and uh, I really enjoyed leading that history program, which it, which remains one of the best history programs in the, in the U.S. government. And um, uh, while I was there, I'd like to think we accomplished some useful things, but uh, my successors in that, in that task since... Since 2002, when I left, uh, have continued to do a terrific job with the program. For sure. And yeah, 2002 was, was some time ago. So what have you been up to since? <laughs> so I, I, I moved from, <laughs> uh, from NASA headquarters to the National Air and Space Museum 
okay. at the Smithsonian. Uh, just you know, flew, my office moved a few blocks down the street. Sure. And uh, I led the space history department there, which is the curatorial department. Ultimately, I became um, the associate director for collections and curatorial affairs there, and I retired from federal service in 2017 uh, out of the Smithsonian. And uh, since that time, I've been doing you know independent research, writing, consulting work, and so forth. Okay, yeah. So um, you know, you uh, tell me some of the other things that you've written prior to pro- to this one. Well, uh, okay. So I, I did in uh, in 2019 a book on the Apollo program called Apollo's Legacy, mm-hmm. and uh, it tries to make sense after 50 years of uh, of what was the what was the Apollo program? Why was it significant? Why do we think about it today. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've written other books on the history of aerospace uh, at the time of the anniversary of the centennial of flight, the Wright Brothers 100th anniversary in 2003. Uh, I was involved in a couple of projects to document the history of flight. Some of those were big, oversized picture books, mm. and, uh, and some of them were scholarly analyses of what does it mean after a century of flying. So there's a variety of things that I've done out there. I also have done other subjects like the history of baseball, uh, Hmm. which is just one of my passions, and I I do because it's fun. Wonderful. Yeah, especially in this book, NACA to NASA to Now, um, some of the things you've written about before, it sounds like the history of aviation after the Wright brothers, the the Apollo program, those were some of the meatiest, some of the densest part of of this book, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's because of your extensive history in those subjects. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, what made you? What inspired you to say to take a look at, you know, NACA, NASA, and say I'm going to try to put everything, some of the most meaningful things, into one volume? What 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 sort of sparked that idea? Yeah, well, I mean, it originated uh, in the uh, early 2010s uh, when we <laughs> we were, we were thinking about the hundredth anniversary of the NACA, and the NACA is the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which is NASA's direct predecessor, and it was formed in in 1915. So I, I was looking at that 1915. Mm-hmm. Centennial and thinking, wouldn't it be great to have a, a sort of an overview of the history of the agency? Hmm. Uh, and that's when I began working on it. Uh, NASA was uh, supportive of the idea, although it, the, the book did not appear in, in, in 2015. Uh, it took a little while longer to do it than, than maybe any of us anticipated. But nonetheless, mm-hmm. uh, it, it turned out, I think, really quite well to cover that hundred years of of aeronautics and space activities at the NACA and NASA. Yeah, yeah, and that's I can't wait to go into it because it does it does do a really good job of covering a lot of those things. And you said you know it takes it took some time to put it together, but um, tell me about your process. Whenever you started kicking off the idea, started pitching the idea, and now you have to go out, you have to start doing some research, you have to start talking to some folks. What was that like? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, at some level, this is a book that I'd been working on for many, many years. I got this long history associated with the history of aerospace, mm-hmm. and uh, and previous work has sort of been associated with pieces of this. So, um, uh, so the idea was to put together a synthesis, a synthesis of of the agency and its evolution from origins to the present. And, um, and, and that sort of capsule, capsule discussion is difficult to do. Um, you know, how do you, how do you do credit to all of the marvelous and broad things that NASA and the NACA previously has been involved in? Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't, you can't tell the story of everything. And, <laughs> uh, and what is the, what are the, the key issues that you want to highlight? And that's, that was a major part of the process of coming to grips with what we were, trying to accomplish in this book yeah so you when when you start at the book i mean uh well if you start reading it it it, it takes it uh, for the most part chronologically you know you right. start off uh, sort of with a high level and then you get into i mean we're, we're going into aviation and the formation of nac after the wright brothers um and this idea of 
this world class research and development program. And so, mm-hmm. to to sort of lay the groundwork for what NASA is today. I mean, and and, and personally, I haven't really dove terribly deep into NACOCA. So, the, these first couple of 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 chapters were very revealing to me in terms mm-hmm. of not only. Um, kind of understanding what NACA was, but how it evolved over time to have it make sense to have it evolve into NASA. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that, that happened was, you know, the Wright brothers were the first to fly at Kitty Hawk in, in 1903. So, you know, Americans fundamentally invented the airplane. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it didn't take 10 years for that technology to basically be outstripped in America. And Europe is leading the world in terms of aviation technology. Uh, the Americans look at World War I, especially, and they see uh, rapid advances in uh, the technology of flight. And they realize that, uh, you know, there's nothing like that that exists here. And the only way to get there is to is to really undertake research and development in this particular arena and a way to do that fundamental way to do it for the public good for the for the larger aspects of all the things that are associated with this military civilian whatever else there might be uh the federal government should take this on that led to the decision and it took a while to get there and i sort of tell that story Mm -hmm. there's some there's some bobs and weaves and ins and outs of the process but ultimately uh, the NACA is the result of that in, in 1915. And and its task is pretty simple, uh, basically to investigate, and this is a term that's, that, that was used in the, in the legislation, to investigate the problems of fight, flight with a view to their practical solution. So we've got to figure out how we're doing this. We've got to hire researchers. We've got to provide them with the tools they need to sort of further of uh, the technology. And the result of that is the NACA, which becomes this world-leading uh, R&D organization. And, and it, it is remarkable to see how this happens from the point that what is now the Langley Research Center is established toward the end of uh, the 19-teens um, through you know, the history, the rest of the history of the NACA up to 1958 when it becomes NASA, um, you've got this uh, unparalleled development of really good engineers who are attracted to the NACA to come to work there because they're going to solve the cutting edge problems uh, of flight, especially in aerodynamics. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the NACA put in their hands the tools that they needed to do this, the funding over long periods of time to, to answer these kinds of questions, and the freedom to pursue this. I mean, it, it is a remarkable story of success. And by the way, those fundamental tools were first and foremost a set of wind tunnels that were built beginning in the 1920s, mm-hmm. uh, and some of which are still in operation today, not all of which, uh, at, at NASA centers. And uh, and they really did change the nature of what we understood about flight in America. Yeah, because I, I I think you know a lot of us, especially that are that are into NASA, we take a look at at NASA and its evolution over decades. And I think one of the more revealing things to me was was just the length of time that the NICA. Um, was developing. You talked about the late 1910s to 1958. That's decades. That's a long right. time. Right. And there's a lot of progress that happens in there that you sort of navigate us through. You talk about the facilities. You talk about, I mean, just the planes in general. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it, I think one of the you know key themes, I'm trying to focus on some of the key themes without getting too, too into the weeds here, but I think, interestingly enough, uh, one of the motivators here was this, and, and you sort of alluded to it when you talked about Europe having, you know, um, you know, taking a lot of this idea of flight and the research and development and, and kind of running with it. Um, that was kind of one of the motivators for the NACA, and that's this idea of of nationalism and competition, right. um, trying to be the best. Um, and and you talked about, you know, World War One. There's there's this militaristic motivator, there's this competitive motivator that's that's very um that's very a strong element in these decades through the NACA. Right, right. Uh, no question about it. So the military component of this is significant. I, I you know, and uh, back in 
those days there was something called the War Department. So it's now the Department of Defense. But uh, they're looking at the activities in World War One, thinking, "Oh my goodness, uh, we've got to figure out a way to do better." And uh, and everybody is doing the same sort of thing. And so pushing technology and pushing the development of aircraft uh, that can do military things is a is an important part of this. But it's not just that. It's it's also uh, the rise of commercial aviation and the fact that mm-hmm. uh, that you've mm-hmm. got the potential for initially one of the early activities was airmail, uh, and that was a big deal. Uh, being able to move um, uh, letters and packages from one place to another in the space of a few hours was was something un- unheard of in in American history previously, mm-hmm. and. And and so uh, so the Postal Service is one of the early adopters of aircraft technology, and they want the best aircraft that's out there too. There's a whole variety of things, and some of those are are, are federal activities, but obviously there's the commercial world as well. So the 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 potential to move passengers and cargo on a commercial basis is a big piece of this, and it pushes a lot of technology in the 1920s and 30s, but. The NACA is at the center of all of this technology development. It's got capabilities and resources and and expertise that is able to solve a bunch of problems that that have application not to an individual airplane per se, but to all kinds of aircraft that are out there in all settings. Yeah, and you and you do a really good job in the book to 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 highlight these different moments and sort of bring it back to the bigger picture of, you know, even with these motivators of sometimes that were nationalism in, in nature, you had these elements, uh, you know, that were purely research and development, the, the progress of humanity. And, and you, and you tell, um, and you make sure to highlight in these stories about how th- these sorts of things in the NACA and at NASA impacted everybody's lives, how they ended up changing sort of the way that we we live. And, you, and commercial aviation is one of those um, big things. You talked about air mail being one of the early um, uses of, of air transportation, um, but, you know, eventually that evolved into people and a lot of the research done um, at, at the NACA change the way that we transport uh, and we travel through the United States and the world today. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, um, and, and this is a debate that historians have been having for a long time. Hmm. Uh, but my argument would be um, that one of the defining technologies of the 20th century was the ability to fly. Uh, at no time in human history have we previously had that capability. So this really did change the nature of everything around us. Uh, every aspect of our society is reordered through this particular uh, capability. And from our, you know, going to a, an airport and getting on an airplane and going to grandma's house, uh, you know, in the space of, of a few hours, as opposed to a, a, at least a day trip or perhaps even longer mm. uh, in previous eras, uh, is a big change, and we don't think anything about it today. It's taken as a given. But it wasn't in, you know, at the time that the NACA was established, those sorts of activities were not common yet. But they would become common within a very short period of time, in no small measure because of the development of technology, and that development of technology was was fundamentally a part of what the NACA was doing to move move society forward. Absolutely. And I think you, you do a good job of, of highlighting those technological advances. Also, in those decades of the NACA, I thought you did a really good job of sorting laying the groundwork for the skills that were required at the time for the NACA, but that would eventually transfer over to NASA. And right. uh, you do so with um, by highlighting um, jobs like the idea of a computer, and at the time it was a, a computer was a person, and these right. computers, you know, were were part of the NACA. But if you know NASA history and you know those early years of, of Mercury, Gemini, and uh, Apollo, you know that human computers were essential to the skills required for human spaceflight. You also do so with people, and I know uh, you laid the groundwork with Robert Gilruth and his time in the NACA, and and as a as a person, his influence in making NASA what it ultimately became. Yeah, so the human computers are a fascinating story. Uh, I mean. 
what we had at the NACA was researchers, engineers, doing research on various aspects of wing development or streamlining processes or compressibility factors, all kinds of issues that were out there that were uh, problems to be solved in terms of flight. And they would, they would, uh, and, and, you know, there are three legs to the stool associated with this research. One is theoretical studies. The NACA had some people who focused on theory. Uh, and, uh, and, and then there is ground studies associated with empirical work. A lot of that was done in wind tunnels. And, um, and then, of course, there's flight research. You test this thing in a, in a, in a vehicle that can leave the ground and do things. Uh, and those, those three elements of this research project really changed the, the dynamics of what we understand about, about flight. And, and then the NACA made that knowledge available through the writing of technical reports and sending them out to everybody. I, I mean, it was remarkable. Mm. Uh, the distribution network that they put in place and the rigor with which these uh, reports were uh, were written and uh, and processed inside of the NACA, but all of the tabulations associated with that research was done by uh, you know the engineers would provide data then then these computers who were who were essentially math whizzes. Um, uh, would sit down and create tables of of of, of information about a particular thing. Uh, and that was a very involved process, and they weren't engineers per se, but but they were indivi- but they were individuals who had this uh, this math skill, and they could produce these uh, these reports through this process. And some of those individuals, especially beginning in World War II and since, were women who uh, whose capabilities were not necessarily appreciated in society in the way they probably should have been. But if you you know, if they went to college and um, and was a math major, they could do a couple of things with that skill set. They could teach school. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But they could also make more money and do something that uh, that was really rewarding by becoming a computer. And there were several at the NACA centers uh, during World War II. Some of those were African American women. Uh, and until the rise of electronic computers later on. Uh, they were the dominant means whereby uh, the NACA and, and NASA in its early years uh, produced uh, data that was usable for other people. Yeah, I loved um, I loved how you kind of, you, you know, you, you can t- look at history and just kind of look at the technology, the facilities. You can look at sort of the hard facts. But I thought just overall you did a pretty good job of weaving the the, the personnel story and, and, the, and the people that w- that that sort of helped uh, to create NASA and, and eventually navigate it through its history, what it was. Not not to jump too far, but but to jump to um, later in the book where you talk about shuttle, um, you do a really good job in those chapters of – Spending some time talking about the people and exploring workplace diversity and those sorts of things. And I know especially, you know, now like the uh, we see some historical books, movies, you know, the one that jumps to mind is Hidden Figures. Sure. Um, but how um, – how the these uh, how how the uh, reach of of NASA you know which was just traditionally for for Mercury right the Mercury Seven all all white men and you and you take take a a personal a social um, look at NASA's history and its evolution of workplace diversity right right well I, I mean you know NASA like uh, lots of organizations. Um, has always faced the challenge of of of, of looking more like America than not, mm. and um, the engineering world uh, and the science world was largely the province of white males for much of the history of of the United States, and um, and with efforts inside the federal government to to diversify to become more inclusive, uh, NASA responded to that and, uh, and, and women and minorities were brought in to, um, uh, to perform a lot of those functions to the extent today that we don't think too much about it. Um, but, uh, that wasn't always the case. And there were notable instances, uh, in the NACA and NASA's history where, uh, where individuals were marginalized for no good reason, through no fault of their own. Um, uh, and and efforts were had to be made to uh, to try to overcome that. Absolutely. 
Now jumping back, uh, just to sort of close this uh, this the NAC conversation, NACA conversation is, um, you know, we talked about where we spent some time talking about the people. You talked about technologies. I think one of the key things that it helped to really uh, us uh, kind of close the NACA portion of the book and sort of pave the way for when we start talking about the formation of NASA and and why these two organizations just made sense. You know, it made sense to evolve NACA into what NASA is as, you know, this research and development. One of the things was the X-planes. And you spend some time talking about those. Chuck Yeager's um, uh, very you know, historic, uh, breaking the sound barrier sort of thing. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, this idea of rocketry in aviation and sort of how we take this, this R and D aspect. And when NASA was forming, um, you, you, uh, do a good job of, of kind of, uh, leading us very, very smoothly from the air, from the back end of NACA to what would eventually become NASA. Yeah, sure. So, um, one of the things that that the NACA did during World War II was uh, was really uh, and appropriately so move all in in terms of military technology and work very closely with what would become the Air Force and the Navy on um, uh, research development uh, for aircraft that would be the most modern, sophisticated that existed in the world, and uh, uh, the X plane series of uh, of aircraft. Uh, you know, the experimental aircraft after World War II, especially, is a direct result of that. And the X-1, uh, which is a f- the famous story that everybody's heard about, mm-hmm. about Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier, not that it was actually a barrier per se, <laughs> um, in 1947 is all, uh, is, is well known. And, uh, and, and Yeager, of course, was an, was an Air Force pilot, but the project was a, was a partnership between the military and, mm-hmm. and NASA. And Bell Aircraft, which was the manufacturer of the X-1. So um, that set in, in train a whole series of, of um, successive programs, uh, which still exist right up to the present. I mean, there's other there, there's X-planes that are out there uh, over time that have done a variety of really important and significant things. The most famous of those is probably the X-15, which flew between the late 1950s and to the late 1960s. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the hypersonic realm, and it's it's a set of uh, of data that uh, is still being used by uh, uh, by people today in terms of what we know about high speed flight in the atmosphere uh, and going to the edge of space. The um, and and those partnerships really uh, really sort of defined a lot of activities of the NACA in the World War II and since era. And have also been important in the context of NASA's efforts since that time. The rise of guided missiles, uh, also resulting from World War II. I mean, there, every nation who was a combatant in World War II built missiles of some type. Mm. Sometimes they were as simple as a rocket-powered grenade that was used on the ground by infantry. The bazooka, if you will, for the American Army. Um, but everybody realized that the that the future of of long range uh military flight was going to be ballistic missiles of some kind mm-hmm. and right at the end of world war 2 the NACA gets involved in that robert gilruth uh who would go on to become the center director at at what is now the johnson space center and led the space task group uh through the mercury gemini and apollo eras um was the leader of that particular effort. He was based at Langley Research Center. He'd been there a number of years. He'd done all kinds of really significant work, but he recognized the necessity of moving in this direction, and he pursued this. They established a facility, which is now Wallops uh, mm-hmm. uh, Flight Facility, and um, and began launching uh uh, missiles out of that, testing them for mostly atmospheric aerodynamics at the time and and uh, and propulsion technologies, but and and didn't get into space. They weren't trying to do that necessarily, but they really laid the groundwork for what NASA would be doing when it became a reality in the 1950s. Yeah, and that's um, that's sort of how you uh, make that transition when you, when we lead uh, out of NACA and into talking about some of the history of NASA. Um, you know, the, the the first things you tackle really are exactly that. 
you know, uh, but but this idea of when you kick off NASA, I think the central theme here is the first things that you that you talk about in the in the book when it comes to uh, NASA's early history is human spaceflight. And that seems to be one of the motivators. Um, you know, you already laid the groundwork earlier in the book uh, with the NACA for nationalism and competition as a motivator. Obviously, Sputnik was one of the key things, if not the key thing, that sparked the formation of NASA um, and and the competition with the Soviet Union at the time. Um, but what, I think it's I think it's fair to conclude that human spaceflight was one of the drivers. Uh, on the formation and the early years of NASA. Absolutely. And, and it, 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 it was a part of a longer discussion about potential for, for space activities. I, I mean, fundamentally, it's about going somewhere else and humans doing that. And, uh, and, and that goes back probably earlier than even the 1940s, but certainly mm-hmm. by then, there's a, 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 a significant aerospace community that's sort of looking forward to that prospect. And uh, as NASA is created, almost coincidental with the creation of NASA, it gets a human space flight mission. There was a long effort before that time inside the Department of Defense uh, to pursue uh, manned uh, flights into space for military purposes, mm-hmm. but um, those those got through a lot of paper studies, but not to the point where they actually uh, uh, got to go ahead to proceed with it. Uh, and that mission by Eisenhower was was given to NASA as soon as it was stood up and operating, beginning in the fall of 1958. Now, um, if you take a look at the book as a whole um, and look at kind of where where what moments are the densest, uh, for sure, at least in, in my experience in reading the book, um, you spend a lot of time um, in those early human spaceflight programs, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, particularly in Mercury and Apollo. But um, would you would you say that it's fair to conclude that? Um, those particular programs in terms of making NASA what it is today, laying the foundation for other programs and the, and the history of the agency in general, um, they, they take the cake in terms of um, considering what programs through all of NASA may be the most formative, may be the most important. Um, I know at the, at the very epilogue uh, of, of the book, you say, you know, of all, it, I guess you get asked this question a lot is, you know, what were, what, what was, you know, the most important program? And I, I think uh, one of the things you pointed out was, was uh, our important mission. And you said Apollo 11 takes a cake for sure. Um, but but you, you mentioned all of these other other things as well. But I think it's fair to conclude that in terms of um, you know, what makes NASA what it is today, that these early programs really were very powerful? Oh, no, no question about it. So uh, I, I sort of think of, of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo as siblings. Mm. And, uh, and Mercury is that first, that, that, you know, the oldest child, per se. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's all of these hopes and dreams that are sort of attached to that. And it's very clear uh, that that's what happened with Mercury. And it was a stellar effort, no question about it. Um, and obviously, you know, the third child in this um, uh, is Apollo, which succeeds beyond expectations and, and, and accomplishes all of these astounding uh, 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 knowledge uh, uh, compilations that result from it. Uh, and, and then the middle child, the Jan Brady, if you will, uh, that middle child is Gemini, which sort of gets lost in the shuffle, but it also was incredibly significant. Mercury was a simple process. Uh, you put an astronaut up, can they survive in space? Nobody knew that when uh, when the, that program was conceived, and it, and the six flights of the Mercury program demonstrated that they that it that it, you could be successful in in Earth orbit, that you could be there for a long period of time. Uh, Apollo is that is that effort that's going to go to the moon in which astronauts are going to get out, they're going to do things there, ultimately leading hopefully to um, a, a long-term exploration of space and, a, and the beginning of, of a multi-planetary species perhaps at some point in the future. Mm-hmm. 
And um, but to get there and do that successfully, Jim and I had to had to work. You had to be able to rendezvous and dock in space. They so had to get out of the spacecraft and do what we now call EVA spacewalks uh, to to accomplish useful things. And that program worked beautifully as well. So those three efforts together over a, essentially a ten year period uh, really did change the dynamic of things that uh, allowed us to understand what we could do and not do in sort of the uh, translunar and cislunar and Earth orbital space. The, um, but, and this is where I think the shuttle and the station are so significant, mm. is that those programs made, um, turned Earth orbit into a normal sphere of human activity. It's, it, it is no longer a frontier. It is no longer a mystery what we're going to encounter yeah. when we go into Earth orbit. And the astronauts, through years of experience with shuttle and station, uh, have, have mastered, and the technical people associated with that, have mastered understanding of this particular thing, uh, enabling us to now use orbital space in ways that we never dreamt of previously. And that's where we are today. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Um, you, you definitely navigate us through that that history from early formation of NASA and a lot of the human spaceflight programs. I appreciate it, though, that, of course, what you're trying to do here in the book is capture as much of you know NASA's storied history. And you have to pull out some of the most significant missions, some of the most significant programs. And after you get through these these dense chapters of Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, you go back in time and you go back to 1960 and start talking about, hey, even though these things were happening and they were absolutely the forefront of NASA, they were the most publicly visible things that were happening um, to, to what people were paying attention to. Trying to land humans on the moon, obviously, is going to capture most people's attention. But in the background, there are these there are these exploration programs, and you talk about a lot of science efforts, um, starting with you know these landers that are exploring the solar system. You talk about the appeal of Mars. We talk about these observatories that are looking at the expanses of the universe. You talk about Earth observations, and you and you weave through some of the most important programs that I think define what captures maybe NASA's science portfolio today and what we find most important but but you navigate and you, and you, you navigate that by jumping back in time after um, after Apollo and sort of taking us through the science programs oh yeah uh, so the uh, uh, I mean very early on uh, in the 1950s, NASA's involved in robotic exploration as well, and the, and the first target, of course, was was the uh, was the moon, and that was directly tied to the to the larger Mercury, Gemini, Apollo effort, and the Ranger and Surveyor and Lunar Orbiter programs are directly uh, feeding into the the moon landing effort as well. But so the moon is a part of that discussion, but the planets are as well. And what else can we understand about this? Well, our two closest possible targets are Venus and Mars. Venus is actually a little bit closer than Mars. It's also a a, a near twin of Earth in terms of size, and there were a lot of uh, mythology associated with uh, what we might find once we get underneath the clouds there, and. Our first efforts, the Mariner program, uh, sends uh, sends probes there in the early 1960s, and we learn that it's an inferno and not a not a place that's very inviting. Uh, but Mars always was thought to be a, a, a sort of a place where we might be able to go, where we might be able to settle, where we might be able to um, you know put colonies ultimately, and uh, and so it has become a target and. We also thought that we might well find some life there, and there's still that possibility. There's a number of folks who are still suggesting that there may be microbial life under me, underneath the planetary surface or, hmm. or, or somewhere else there. And, um, and that has driven a lot of activity. And what we have found there has been stupendously exciting over time. And there's people who are jazzed about that, and, of course, the rovers there and the and the landers and the helicopter possibilities and the airplane possibilities and on and on and on uh, in terms of our robotic exploration of Mars and ultimately with the potential of putting boots on the ground there. 
uh, has uh, has motivated a lot of activity in terms of Mars exploration. Beyond that, of course, there's outer planetary exploration to the to the gra- uh, to the uh, to the to the giants, the gas giants that are out there, and um, and the outer edges of the solar system, and the potential to get above the atmosphere with observatories, with telescopes. Most famous of those, of course, uh, although they are not the first, is the Hubble Space Telescope, Mm -hmm. deployed by the shuttle in 1990, serviced several times, and still operational today. The uh, recently um, uh, deployed uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which has been stupendous Mm -hmm. in what it has uh, offered us in just, uh, you know, a little more than a year of activity. So um, we're... We're excited and jazzed by that, and that whole effort uh, has prompted us to learn and understand more effectively about the cosmos than ever before. And uh, there is there is nobody that's out there who um, who is not energized by the knowledge gained through these processes. Yeah, and I think I think that's probably one of the most telling things by the time you finish this chapter is just how much of an impact these programs made on humanity's knowledge of the cosmos. Um, absolutely revealing, and especially you know, kind of bringing it back to human spaceflight. You mentioned this already, but but the the. In, the as we were exploring, it became more and more interesting, this this idea of traveling to Mars and the secrets that it can unlock that is today a key motivator for why we want to put boots on that particular planet out of all of right. them. Right, you bet. Um, Mars is a special case. I mean, so I, I can recall in the mid-1960s when I was in grammar school, uh, our science books, which were a little outdated, but they said in no uncertain terms that they that that they believed that there was life on on the planet Mars, and their reason for believing this was that they saw changes to the planetary surface from telescopes here on Earth. This is before the first probes had been sent there, mm. and. Um, and that probably there was algae growing or lichens of some kind growing there, and they they would change with the seasons. And I personally was excited by that when I was a kid. Uh, lots of other people were. But as it turns out, and, and NASA showed us uh, through a succession of efforts, that has not been the case. Uh, what they saw were dust storms and a variety of other things. Nobody was making this up. They just, uh, you know, the data was not sufficiently advanced to to really tell the full story at that point in time. But that doesn't mean that there's not some really significant things to learn there, and it also doesn't mean there's not life that exists there. And I'm not suggesting little green men or anything like that, Mm. but, um, uh, but, you know, perhaps the potential for microbial life of some kind. And, uh, and that still energizes a lot of people, myself included. I mean, Right. In my mind, a fundamental science question of this is, are we alone in the universe? And I don't believe we are. I think, I think there's other entities out there. Uh, I also don't believe they're visiting Earth, so don't, get, don't, don't, ever, don't anybody think that I'm <laughs> a, a believer in UFOs and things of that nature uh, that are coming here from other planets. But, um, but that, I think, is a fundamental question. I'd love to know the answer to that. I'd like to think in our lifetimes we will definitively learn the answer to that question. Yeah, and it's becoming kind of more and more realistic, right? A lot of these programs, I think the one that, that – um, and, and observatories, the one that comes to mind is Kepler. Um, just, you know, they keep adding new planets all the time of right. uh, these planets that they're finding, and it's becoming more clear that there are so many planets. We didn't know that for a while, that, that there were so many stars that had so many planets orbiting them, and that there would be a lot in this ca- category of habitable um, and so, yeah, exactly that. You know, is is there life out there? It's becoming increasingly, I think, positive. I think there's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of optimistic scientists out there that are saying that it's very possible, but, um, you know, like they're really, really far away. So, yeah, um, yeah, exactly that. Not, not exactly little green men, but, uh, I thought you did a really good job in, in, in those couple of chapters. Um, you know, you talked shuttle next, but I wanted to jump to, um, aeronautics because we talked so much about it in the beginning of the, of our podcast today about the NACA. Um, you sort of bring it, bring it back that says, you know, there, there's that first A in NASA, the, the aeronautics. Um, and, and we never sort of let go of that, even though we were exploring space, uh, we were still making these advancement in, um, human aviation. Right. Well, and we, and we can't minimize that. I, yeah. and, and it sort of gets lost, lost in the shuffle for most people. Exactly. Uh, you know, the NACA becomes NASA and, uh, and, and sort of the aeronautics part of this research and development effort falls by the wayside for most people. But it's still there and it's still doing really significant things uh, right up to the present. Uh, and if you look at any piece of, 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 of technology associated with flight, and you're going to find NASA's fingerprints over the R&D on this. Uh, it, 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 is, it is pretty much everywhere. And I'm fascinated by, uh, by obviously, things like the X programs, which still exist mm-hmm. uh, and were, have been operated in the context of you know, the NASA environment uh, as well. But, uh, but there's you know, much smaller things that you don't necessarily think about. Um, and, and, I, and I love the use of things like um, the uh, research plane that Langley had for many years uh, that was basically doing things like wind shear research and how to, how to create warning systems so that pilots know if there's going to be a, a dramatic wind shear as they're coming in for a landing. And, um, and, 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 the, the so-called glass cockpit, the the uh, the digital uh, instruments that are now ubiquitous in aircraft that uh, uh, that were pioneered uh, by lots of people, but NASA was at the center of a lot of that research as well. The the modern and futuristic possibilities for air traffic control, and and I could go on and on. Mm-hmm. And these are not things that grab a lot of headlines, at least in the you know it's not like astronauts watching walking on the moon, but it is incredibly significant Mm -hmm. and it has made a flight one of the safest forms of transportation that exists and uh and ubiquitous worldwide you know i find it uh um, you know, when we when we started this conversation about the the idea of of writing the book and and the one of the kind of sparks of inspiration for starting it at this time, originally in the 2010s, uh, was coming up on the centennial of, of NACA, you know, 1915, 2015. I think what's what's interesting is I was, I was kind of curious as I was getting towards the end of the book on how this is going to go because um, what what's interesting is just how much progress has been made in these past couple of years. Um, you know, I, I think back to 2015 and where we are in 2023. Um, a lot has happened in the world of commercial space. And uh, I, I find it uh, interesting um, that, you know, one of the ways that you sort of end the book is this idea of, of commercialization. Um, you, you start with some of the early efforts of commercialization and then, and then take it through, um, you know, demo, uh, demo two. So I think maybe, maybe I, and I'm, I'm curious to hear about your process because um, when you started writing this, right, and then how you had to maybe make some adjustments along the way that says, oh, you know, we keep adding to the to the story here of, of there's this there's this there's this rapid um, progress in commercialization. And I wonder how you navigated that progress in terms of writing the book and trying to figure out a way on how and when to close it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's always the challenge when you're trying to come up to as close to the present as possible right. when, you're, when you're writing something like this. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it's obvious that the 21st century, sort of a, a, a dramatic shift, has been um, not NASA contracting with an outside prime contractor for some spacecraft or whatever it happens to be, but uh, but a possibility of vendors that are uh, in a variety of places with a variety of capabilities and you can pick and choose and, 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 and contract for a ride on a vehicle as opposed to the vehicle itself. And that's been a shift, uh, no question about it. Mm-hmm. And there were people at NASA when I was there in the 1990s 
who were championing this particular uh, prospect for the future. That uh, and and there were there were individuals in the private sector who were trying to make it a reality, uh, often without a lot of success. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. the. Um, uh, the the difficulty has been the uh, 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 you know as I, the way I usually frame it is you know in the in the 1990s the landscape was was littered with failed launch vehicle companies mm. uh, they, they'd be formed they would get venture capital they would try to uh, try to achieve their uh, uh, their uh, agenda in terms of building a new launch vehicle that could uh, be used for a variety of purposes including supplying. Uh, what became the International Space Station when it was placed in orbit, and uh, and most of them failed, uh, and and there were a couple that were successful, and I always like to point back to Orbital Sciences in the 1980s, which which built the a, a, a launcher that was actually launched off of an L-1011. It was an air-launched vehicle hmm. that could put payloads into orbit, and uh, done, you know, without. You know, it was not done as a as a government contract. These guys did it on their own, and they created a company that ultimately became um, a, a part of Northrop Grumman and is now launching the Cygnus Antares uh, launcher for for uh, all kinds of purposes, including supplying the space station. The um, and, and then of course SpaceX and Elon Musk's effort uh, to develop another launch capability that's also been critical in this process as well. But those come, but that one comes a little bit later on. Mm-hmm. And in the 1990s, when I was at NASA, not everybody was sure this was going to work, and there were a lot of people who were questioning whether or not this is the right way to go. Um, and and, and the rationale was not just sort of pigheadedness or. Uh, you know, living in the past or any of that kind of stuff. It was it was concern about whether or not private sector had the capabilities uh, to pull this off. They had the resources necessarily uh, necessary to to make it a reality, and whether or not they might cut a few corners in terms of safety. Uh, and one of the things that has panned out here has been this transition to uh, to commercial uh, services that NASA can now buy, rather than buying a space shuttle and all the components uh, for that, they can now buy a ride on uh, on a couple of different vehicles that are private sector owned and operated. Yeah, and and it'll be it'll be very telling to see what happens over the next couple of years, over the next decade or so. I know. NASA's current efforts right now is expanding upon that. That idea, as you mentioned, you know, not a lot, a lot of folks thought it could work a while ago, but I think industry has proven um, that this capability is is very possible, and not only possible, but um, seems to be the, the the way forward for particularly low Earth, low Earth orbit. Um, you know, that there's talks now about the station is not going to last forever, so what comes next? And the idea is these commercial orbiting space stations that is... Like, Exactly like you 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 were talking about with um, you know purchasing a, purchasing a service as a either transportation provider cargo provider the idea is that, you know you, it's almost like a kind of hotel visit you're you're purchasing space on a on a space station so it sort of leads the the book sort of ends with this idea of you know this 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 commercialization and I, I sort of wanted to kind of get your grasp on on. Um, you know, with with figuring out how to end this book and, and figuring out kind of where this is going, I think what's interesting is so much has been ha- has changed in the past decade. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm sure the idea of, of writing and finishing and publishing a book, um, you know, you, you, you write it and, and you get get it ready to go. And then, you know, you have things like Artemis, right? Artemis 1. Uh, that lifts off, and it's it's this beginning of a new chapter. And I know you address it in the ep- epilogue, and you and this um, you talk about the benefits of the moon. Uh, I, I kind of want to hear your perspective on that. Just given given your deep research and writing into NASA's storied history, um, the the idea that you you end the book with this commercialization thing, but w- it's almost like we're we're about to start this new chapter of of human space exploration, particularly with Artemis. And I wanted to g- kind of gauge your thoughts on, on that program and, and those efforts. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that, that, uh, that, that's happening, and I, I do see this as a reality and a very positive development, is that uh, NASA is able to move 
uh, from Earth orbital activities. It can turn that over to to private sector firms uh, and whatever activities that are necessary that NASA needs to engage in in Earth orbit, they can buy those services from someone else. Mm -hmm. So servicing the space station, uh, ferrying astronauts to and from that, or a follow-on you know, habitat in space or whatever, or research uh, facility in space, or whatever comes beyond this. Uh, and NASA can buy those services from, from someone else. But that frees the agency up to pursue ex- the exploration agenda in trans and, and uh, cis lunar space. And I really think, I mean, and that's where Artemis is headed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the ability to go back to the moon and, and, to, and to do some things there and, uh, and perhaps establish, a, I think the first step is a research station on the moon. And, um, and that research station is probably not going to be flashy. Uh, probably not going to be, you know, a, 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 a glass domed facility or anything like that. For mm. one thing, cosmic rays would be a problem, but um, but it would look probably a lot like Antarctica. There would be a, a, a community of researchers, uh, scientists, engineers, whoever other types might need to be there for for a purpose for some period of time, and uh, and they would be taken in and out. Uh, on a regular schedule, and that's the that's our first step to move off this planet. To be perfectly honest, on a on a sustained basis, uh, and we'll, I think we're going to see that. Uh, I'd like to think in my lifetime, the uh, and certainly in the 21st century, I think we will see that. Uh, you know, from there, you know, maybe we can make we can incorporate the moon into a normal realm of human activity. We're not close to that yet, but I'd like to think that that will happen and ultimately then move on to Mars and other places beyond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a very interesting time. I'm, I'm, uh, it'll be interesting to see the, you know, NACA to NASA to now volume two after, uh, <laughs> after all this is said and done. I, um, I, I kind of wanted to end with, well, uh, sort, of, sort of begin wrapping up here with, uh, you know, you, you published uh, this as a NASA ebook. Um, and I'm curious as to as to why you made that decision. I know I know you have history with NASA. Um, you could have gone other places, but um, this 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 wonderful book is freely available on NASA.gov. Uh, and I wonder why you made that decision. Well, I, I mean, one of the things that uh, so I'm my initial conception of this was something we would do for NASA, mm. and um, and NASA has had a one volume history in the past. Uh, there's a a volume that was published in the 1980s called Orders of Magnitude that was sort of a synopsis of the of the agency's history. Mm. Roger Bilstein, a very fine historian, was the author of that. Uh, and but but that book, by the time we started talking about that, was you know 25 years old, and a lot had happened uh, during that period of time, and we gained a lot of understanding beyond you know even areas that he talked about. So. Um, it seemed logical to produce a one-volume history, and, and my audience for this fundamentally is NASA, uh, the people who are there today, uh, mm. who are certainly acquainted with some aspects of NASA's history, and are very much there because they want to be engaged in these kinds of activities. NASA's an unusual federal agency. Uh, you know, there's there's obviously people of all skill sets who are associated with this uh, there are scientists engineers astronauts technicians uh, but there's also you know bookkeepers and accountants and contract people and you know you name it but they all are motivated by this by this larger agenda of of doing really interesting cutting edge things pointed toward the future uh, in terms of air and space and and that is uh, there's a camaraderie around that uh, a a sense of cohesion to the mission that um, that permeates the agency. It did from the very origins of of the NACA right up to the present. That's maybe not quite the same in in lots of other uh, institutions where you don't necessarily have an identity. 
uh, with the um, with the mission of the organization that the NAFTA folks have. And I find that remarkable. And being able to tell that story of things that have been done in the past, both those that are positive and well as some that are negative, uh, and you know the, the successes and the failures, mm-hmm. uh, I think is 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 really an important thing to do, and that everybody should have an understanding of. Well, we certainly appreciate it. I mean, as as part of the NASA workforce myself, I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, I learned a lot, absolutely. And uh, I'll tell you, just just getting the chance to talk to you and kind of hear more that goes even deeper into sort of the background and your thoughts, your overall thoughts of uh, of NASA and its story. Um, you can tell you're you're very passionate about this, and so I feel very lucky to have had the chance to talk with you today, Roger. It's it's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure, and I and I thank you for get. Um, Hopping on the phone today to and and chatting with us to um, to give us more perspective on this. I hope folks that are listening are inspired to go and check this book out. Yeah, I hope they I hope they really like it. Uh, obviously, you can download it, but there are hard copies available as well uh, by uh, contacting the NASA History Office. Wonderful, wonderful, Roger Lanius. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. All right. Hey, thanks for sticking around. Hope you learned something today. Fantastic to chat with Roger about his book. He went into great detail, but of course, I very much encourage you to go to nasa.gov slash ebooks and check out this book, read it through its entirety. We really just skimmed the surface today and just sort of introduced you to a lot of those key concepts and themes, um, but really, if you want the meaty stuff, highly recommend you go and uh, check out that book. Uh, he mentioned uh, sort of at the very end, you can read it as a as an ebook. You can download the PDF. Um, there's the access to it is free. It's actually one of the reasons that we're able to talk to Roger uh, today. I don't really get a chance to promote uh, other books, but because this is on NASA.gov, because it's free, um, it is is there for your enjoyment. And I had a great time being able to chat with with him today. Uh, of course, if you want to check out more podcasts, we're not the only one at NASA. You can go to nasa.gov slash podcast. It's in the same drop-down menu that you can find the ebooks. You can find us there, and you can listen to any of our episodes in no particular order. You can also check out some of the other shows that we have across the agency. We also monitor social media from time to time uh, and check to see if there's any questions or if anyone has any episode suggestions. We're on the NASA Johnson Space Center pages of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you can use the hashtag at Ask NASA uh, to submit those if you would like. This episode was recorded on March 16th, 2023. Thanks to Will Flato, Pat Ryan, Heidi Lavelle, Belinda Polito, and Jane Jennings. And of course, thanks again to Roger Lanius for taking the time to come on the show. Give us a rating and feedback on whatever platform you're listening to us on and tell us what you think of our podcast. We'll be back next week. The cat that went tingling. Hello, this is Jana, and I'm here with two fables by Aesop. Aesop lived in ancient Greece and wrote stories with morals, such as The Boy Who Cried Wolf or The Hare and the Tortoise. I'm sure you've heard of them, and we have versions here on Story Nori. I'm now going to tell you two of his not quite so famous fables but they are still really fun. They're probably more for our younger listeners. In between the stories, I'm going to welcome a new sponsor to Story Nori, Little Passports. So listen out for a great special offer, because you know how mums and dads like to save a little money. But first, here's the story of the cat that went tingling. A family of mice lived in an old house. When I say a family, I mean a big family with lots of cousins and second cousins and third cousins, not to mention aunties and shanties and relations whose names I'm not even sure of. Fortunately, the house was large and the family of humans who lived there liked to eat well. They were always well stocked with cheese, ham, crackers, granary bread, biscuits, apples, cakes and lentils, pulses, 
and all the things that mice like to eat, just as much as humans do. At night, there were plenty of delicious crumbs in the kitchen and dining room, just waiting to be picked up, because the family were lazy and only liked to sweep up in the morning. Well, the mice did some tidying up for them. Unfortunately, the family had bought a kitten the previous year, and now the kitten had grown up into a young cat about the house. The children thought the cat was extremely cute, which he was if you were a human. He was a rag doll with sky blue eyes and dark markings on his nose and paws. He was very friendly and cuddly to humans, and liked to play games like chasing a piece of wool. But if you were a mouse, he was anything but cute. Cats have claws and teeth, and they mistake mice for toys. They like to stalk and pounce on them. And if you are a mouse, well, that's not nice. For the first time ever, the family of mice started to get smaller, rather than larger. Great Grandpa Mouse called a family meeting to discuss the crisis. The mice met under the floorboards of the boys' bedroom, where they felt safe, even when they were squeaking. Secretly, the boy liked mice and thought they were cute, so he didn't tell his dad when he heard squeaking, in case he set mouse traps. I have to say, I disagree with that boy. I'm not a fan of mice. But everyone has a right to their own opinion, I suppose. Anyway, let's return to the meeting under the floorboards. It was very crowded, and the mice were jostling for a good position to hear the main speaker. Quiet, quiet! Called out Great Grandpa Mouse. Everybody, stop squeaking! We have serious business to discuss. This is a life and death matter. So it's an existential crisis," said a mouse called Judith, who lived under the TV in the living room and heard the language the TV people used to sound smart. Exactly," said Great Grandpa Mouse, who had never heard the phrase before. "The cat is a threat to us all. We need to plan to solve this terrible problem. Does anyone have a suggestion?" Let's move house," said a small brown mouse. "Oh yes, let's live by the seaside," chipped in another. "The sea is far away, and besides, we might get eaten by a shark or pinched by the crabs, which is no better than becoming a cat snack." The mice squeaked for a while, but none of them came up with a solution. "Silence! Silence!" Declared Grandpa Mouse, "You're all talking nonsense. It's all noise and no signal." Added Judith, the mouse who kept up with the news. At last, a young rodent called Jimmy piped up. "I know, Great Grandpa Mouse. Someone should tie a bell to the cat's tail. Then every time he comes to get us, we shall hear tickling." And know that we must scamper for cover. Dingling, hey," said Great Grandpa Mouse. "That's cute and rather clever. Well done, lad. What did you say your name was?" "Jimmy, sir." "Well done, Jimmy, laddie, for volunteering to tie a bell to the cat. Extremely brave, I might say." Now, everyone, show your appreciation for a courageous. Mouse, for making the highest sacrifice in the cause of the greater good. Say your farewells to young Jimmy. There's a good chance this is the last time we'll ever see him. But if he succeeds, we shall all be mighty grateful to him. No, ah,、oh, no, Mr. Great Grandpa Mouse, sir. I didn't mean that I would tie the bell to the cat," declared Jimmy, who really had no intention of volunteering to tie the bell to the cat. But nobody heard Jimmy's plaintive cry because they were squeaking their appreciation. 
They all squealed so loud that the human boy woke up and said, "Hey, mice!" Stop that silly racket, or I'll sleep with the cat on my bed, and then you'll be sorry. That very same night, little Jimmy Mouse had no choice but to sneak out through a hole in the skirting board. If he had refused to venture forth, all the other mice would call him a coward for the rest of his life. Now his life might be rather short, but at least. It would be glorious. Oh dear! I don't want to be a hero. There must be a moral in this story. Something like, better to keep your foolish mouth shut than to squeak up and be a smarty pants. It so happened that the kids of the house had a little wooden fire truck with bells on. The boy would pull it along on a string, and it would go. Dingling! You might never have seen one of those, but back in the days gone by, before the world became virtual, kids played with real toys, and they also used to read, draw, play ball in the park, climb actual trees, graze their knees, and listen to stories read aloud, like this one. Oh, you are listening to this story, so you probably do those other things too. Well, good for you, because those are the things Story Nori kids like. Anyway, our brave little mouse took the string of the fire truck in his mouth, and pulled it along very slowly, hoping that the bells wouldn't ring and wake the cat. When he reached the basket where the cat was curled up asleep, he looped the string over the tip of its tail, hoping very much that it did not awaken. If the cat is pretending to be asleep and watching him through the slits of its eyes, this will be a very short story, and I can go put my feet up. At least the end will be quick, he thought, trying to look on the bright side. The cat purred from deep inside its stomach. Jimmy froze. I think he's only dreaming," he said to himself. Little Jimmy tied a sailor's knot around the cat's tail. How did he learn to do that? Well, don't ask me. I can't tie knots, but he did pull it tight and make his escape. When he returned to the chill-out zone under the floorboards, his friends crowded round and asked him to tell his story. They were all amazed by his bravery. Get away! You don't say! Wow, you're a hero. Are you sure it's safe to go out? They asked. Eventually, Great Grandpa Mouse called everyone to attention. Now, little Jimmy has done a very brave thing, and survived. I need a volunteer. We must have one more little hero here, and Jimmy Mouse certainly hoped that he wasn't the only hero. The mice were unusually quiet, because mice are not cut out to be heroes, and they had all seen that little Jimmy's suggestion had very nearly got him killed. But the silence didn't last long, because they soon heard a sound coming from above them. The cat's on the move," called out Jimmy. A moment later, a brown mouse called Cousin Gordon dived through a hole into the chill room. He was in possession of a huge crumb of banana cake, and more importantly, his own life. The bells! The bells! He cried out with wide open eyes. It seems the advance warning solution has worked," declared Judith. Grandpa Mouse agreed. Everyone squealed in delight so loud that they woke up Mum and Dad in the next room. <laughs> We've been invaded by an army of mice," <laughs> declared Mum, who shares my view of rodents. 
Well, I don't have to tell you what happened next, but I can tell you that at the next family meeting, the surviving mice held a vote, and all but one declared that they wanted to move to the seaside, which they did. They found a nice cafe by the sea, where they all lived very happily. I won't tell you the name of the cafe in case they sue me, but I won't be going to eat there myself. And that was the story of the cat that went tingling. Don't go away because we've got another fable from Aesop coming up. But I'm still wondering what the moral of this story was, if any. I'm scratching my head. What do you think, Bertie? Hmm, I'm not sure. I'll just look up what Milo Winter said about it. He wrote the version that I read before I cooked up this kind of concoction. It's one thing to say that something should be done, but it's quite a different matter to do it. So, in just over a minute's time, I'm going to be reading you a bonus story from Aesop. It's called "The Wolf and the Kid." We'll keep it short and sweet. But first, I'm delighted to welcome a new sponsor to Story Nori. They are called Little Passports, and they share a lot of our values, such as opening up kids' eyes to a whole world of knowledge and culture. As a mother, I know just how satisfying it feels to see my children discovering new things about the world. Little Passports is an award-winning subscription that sends a box of wonders to your door every month. The box is full of play-based kits that fuel curiosity through fun and hands-on activities, and of course, it's all screen-free. You can't help smiling as you watch them explore the world from the safety of your own living room. There's a choice of kits for ages from three to ten years old. For example, I've ordered the World Edition for my daughter. The kit explores new cultures, one country at a time, through projects, puzzles, souvenirs, and activities that spark a global connection. This holiday, give the young explorer in your life a world of adventure. Get twenty percent off any new subscription with promo code Story at LittlePassports dot com. By the twentieth of December for Christmas delivery, free shipping included. That's littlepassports.com promo code story. And by the way, this offer only applies to our listeners in the USA. So before we go, here's a short and sweet tale by Aesop. The Wolf and the Kid. There was once a little kid goat whose growing horns made him think he was a grown-up billy goat, and able to take care of himself. So one evening, when the flock of goats started home from the pasture, and his mother called, the kid paid no heed and kept right on nibbling the tender grass. A little later, when he lifted his head, the flock was gone. He was all alone. The sun was sinking. Long shadows came creeping over the ground. A chilly little wind came creeping with them, making scary noises in the grass. The kid shivered as he thought of the terrible wolf. Then he started wildly over the field, bleating for his mother. But not halfway, near a clump of trees. There was the wolf. The kid knew there was little hope for him. Please, Mister Wolf. Please, Mister Wolf. He said, trembling. I know you are going to eat me, but first, please pipe me a tune, for I want to dance and be merry as long as I can. The wolf liked the idea of a little music before eating. So he struck up a merry tune, and the kid leaped and frisked gaily. Meanwhile, the flock was moving slowly homeward. In the still evening air, the wolf's piping carried far. The shepherd dogs pricked up their ears. 
They recognize the song the wolf sings before a feast. And in a moment, they were racing back to the pasture. The wolf's song suddenly ended. And as he ran with the dogs at his heels, he called himself a fool for turning Piper to please a kid. When he should have stuck to his butcher's trade. And the moral is, do not let anything turn you from your purpose. And that was The Wolf and the Kid, originally by the ancient Greek fabulist Aesop. This is the version by the American writer Milo Winter, who is best known as an illustrator. I do hope that you enjoyed these two Aesop fables. And don't forget your special offer at Little Passport's promo code STORY. From me, Jana, at storynori.com. Bye for now. Introducing Flip and Mosey's Guide to How to Be an Earthling. Hello, this is Jana. If you were an alien from outer space, what would you make of planet Earth? Do you think that everything that goes on here makes perfect sense? Or is the way we do things not always strictly logical? Well, if you want to see our world through alien eyes, here's the perfect podcast for you. Listen to Flip and Mosey's Guide to How to Be an Earthling. New from Wondery, who are kindly sponsoring this episode. It features travel blogging aliens Flip and Mosey. These lovable aliens spend their time travelling around planet Earth, meeting different animal species as they try to learn how to be an earthling. And it features new original music by Grammy-nominated artists. The Pop-Ups. You're about to hear a preview of Flip and Mosey's guide to how to be an earthling. While you're listening, follow on Amazon Music or Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to right now. To listen to new episodes ad-free and one week early, subscribe to Wondery Plus Kids in Apple Podcasts or Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. You can also listen to episodes one week early on Amazon Music. Spaceship hit a rock. Spaceship hit a rock. We crashed down on the nearest planet and waited for a tow truck. Waited for a tow We're professional intergalactic travelers and we're n- 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 new to your planet. I'm uh, oh, uh, Mosey and this is Flip. <laughs> we will write down everything we experience so the next alien who reads it will know what to expect before they arrive here. Because, because we, we gotta, gotta know what is dead animal you're holding? Well, yes, this is a lemming. Please enjoy. Okay. Remember what we've learned about this animal. They are white and puffy. They are so white and And puffy. hard to see in the snow. Mm-hmm. They are good hunters right. with a great sense of smell. Uh-huh. They're peeing on you. Well, not always. I mean, not just that one time. No, right now they're peeing on you. Oh, Francis, I'm a new coach. 
Flip and Mosey's Guide to How to Be an Earthling is available every Thursday on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or listen ad-free and one week early by subscribing to Wondery Plus Kids in the Wondery app. And that was a special preview of Flip and Mosey's Guide to How to Be an Earthling with lots of music and fun facts about our world. Wow, I can't wait to hear the first episode. Be sure to catch it wherever you listen to podcasts. For now, from me, Jana, at StoryNori.com, goodbye. The Tiger Who Became Vegan Hello, this is Jana. You may not know this because this is an audio podcast, but my parents were born in India, where this story comes from. I like this story in particular because there are some delicious and fragrant foods involved. It's all about a tiger who marries an Indian girl. But he doesn't love her. He just wants her to cook for him. The description of the food reminds me of home, with both my parents being excellent cooks. My mother was vegetarian for many years and she loved cooking all sorts of wonderful sabjis and dals. Her mint sauce was super delicious and made fresh from her garden. And if we ever had a tummy ache or felt unwell, she would know exactly which ingredients to cook up as a natural medicine. Our nostrils were always filled with inviting aromas. As the saying goes, mother's food is the best. And it sure is. Mostly because it was made with love and of course skill. My father also cooks the most amazing tandoori chicken and lamb curry, among other dishes. Too many to mention, but I can tell to turn down. I feel very blessed to have a whole family circle of exceptional cooks. But I have to say, the best feel-good aroma has to be the tantalising scent of jai or tea boiled up with a whole library of comforting, aromatic mixes of eastern spices and herbs, including cardamom, ginger, fennel seeds, star anise and cloves. So that's a little background. I hope it gets you in the mood for our story. Our version is quite funny, and we hope you enjoy this lively tale. There was once a tiger who had reached middle age. His tummy was spreading and he developed various aches and pains. These annoyances made him even more bad-tempered and grumpy than he was naturally. He roared so much that he scared away his food before he could pounce on it and eat it up. Then emptiness made his tummy groan with hunger. The tiger felt so out of sorts that even his wide knowledge of magical herbs could not help him. He needed advice from a true guru. So he visited the tree of the wise old monkey to consult him about his pains. The wise old monkey asked the tiger to open his mouth and say, Ah! So that he could look into his throat. And then he tapped the tiger on the back and asked him to cough. And finally he pressed the tiger's tummy and asked him to say where it hurt. After much scratching and thinking, the wise old monkey gave his best medical opinion. In my view, you eat far too much red meat 
and this is the cause of your discomfort you should consider becoming vegan you don't expect me to eat dal do you asked the astonished tiger why not eating dal is very healthy and i tell you where i come from it is among one of the most important staple foods by the way dal is a kind of thick soup made from pulses like lentils i am the most noble animal in the forest why should i eat such low food and how will my tiger instinct be able to give up a juicy fat deer he said licking his lips at the mere thought of his favorite meat lentils are simple but they are also very holy even the most top class humans eat them i recommend the ayurvedic diet it is the food of the brahmins you know they are the highest and most noble class the ayurvedic diet you say it's not some sort of foodie fad is it what's in it now the wise old monkey scratched himself with his back leg for a while before saying there is no simple answer the correct balance of food and lifestyle for your dosha or body type supports good health stable energy and mindfulness in addition you should practice yoga but for all the tip top tricks you must go ask the human pandits in particular the brahmins the tiger trusted the word of the wise old monkey perhaps a change of diet and a touch of yoga would make him feel young again there's no gain without pain as they say he resolved to give the ayurvedic diet a try for that he needed the help of the humans normally it's not easy for a tiger to stroll up to a human and ask a question but fortunately this tiger had the ability to change his identity he ate the bark of a certain tree in the forest nibbled on some secret grass and made some magic moves like turning in a circle a certain number of times bit by bit his stripy coat turned into fine robes and his strong limbs became human ones in this form as a strong noble looking man he left the forest and visited the human village his hair flashed silver at the sides to reflect his years his back still gave him trouble and his stomach was growling with hunger but in most other ways he would not have recognized his own reflection in the water he appeared totally human as it turned out the tiger who looked like a man was in luck the first village he came to was celebrating a wedding the son of a brahmin was marrying a girl from the next village it was a noisy affair with cymbals and trumpets laughing and dancing but most of all he could smell food Yum. The villagers welcomed the noble-looking visitor and invited him to join their celebration. The cooking smelt so good that it made the tiger man's mouth water. And he almost meowed. As it was a special occasion, there were mountains of fluffy fragrant rice flavored with jeera, which are cumin seeds. It wasn't the tiger's usual kind of food, but he found it pleasantly filling. The Brahmin family were astonished to see their guest 
gobble down four large platefuls, when really just one would have been enough to feed a family. Naturally, there were various dishes of dal, all flavoured differently with zesty herbs. He picked up an aromatic bowl of goddu and jana dal, which is pumpkin and chickpeas. He licked it clean, but a couple of fiery chilli peppers found their way into his mouth. They burnt like hot flames. Tears flooded out of the tiger man's eyes. As he was sitting near a bucket of water, he wasted no time guzzling down the whole lot. But the water didn't put the fire out in his mouth. Fortunately, the mother of the bride noticed his distress, so she handed him a large bowl of cucumber and mint. Which cooled him down and relieved his burning throat. Feeling somewhat better, and still hungry, he tried a plate of alu gobi, a potato and cauliflower curry, that was flavoured with jat masala. And that was even spicier. This time. He had to gulp down two whole buckets of iced mango juice, and a whole cart of goofy ice cream, made with pistachios and coconut cream, to help calm the heat. The mother of the young man who was getting married was very impressed by their guest. She said to her husband. A gentleman who is used to eating such quantities of food. Must come from an extremely wealthy family, and it seems that he appreciates my cooking. I say he would be a fine husband for our daughter, if we can marry her to such a man. I can die happily knowing that all our children are married well. Her husband, the Brahmin, agreed that the strong, well-dressed visitor would indeed make a splendid match for their daughter. He sat down by the guest, inquired about his family, and encouraged him to stay as their honoured guest for as long as he wished. The guest, of course, did not give the Brahmin true answers to his questions. It would not do to admit that he was actually a tiger, disguised by magic. Instead, he claimed to be the son of a powerful. A noble Raj, who lived on the other side of the forest. This increased the desire of the Brahmin parents to marry their daughter to him. The days passed, and the tiger guest spent the time sleeping and eating like a prince. Sometimes he practiced a few yoga stretches and poses, but apart from that, there was very little that he did all day. The Brahmin parents were more and more impressed. Only a spectacularly wealthy lord could be so idle and greedy. The tiger had few words, but one day, he asked the mother of the family if she knew what his dosha type was. Doshas are the energy patterns that flow around our bodies. He asked how he should adjust his diet accordingly. She replied, "Well, I would say that your dosha is big and hungry, and what you require is lots and lots of food." And the tiger thought how wise she was. At the end of the month, the Brahmin father asked the tiger if he would like to marry his daughter. The tiger had not been expecting such a question, but he immediately saw the advantage. He had begun to enjoy spicy food and could manage medium hot dishes without discomfort. Perhaps his greatest discovery of all was Ayurvedic chai, a specially made tea with stomach-settling ingredients. And after every large meal, the sweet, fragrant chai was what he looked forward to the most. His middle-aged spread had gone, and along with it, all his aches and pains.
he felt ten years younger. In fact, he had never felt better in his entire life. He was still a tiger in his heart, and he longed to return to his home deep in the forest. But when he went back, there would be nobody to make dal or pakora and tamarind or imli chutney, or aloo sag sabji, a potato and spinach dish. He would slip back into his meat-eating ways. No doubt, his aches and pains would return. Now here was the solution. He would marry a noble girl, who knew how to cook. This plan appealed to him greatly. He readily agreed. It was not long before the couple were wed, and what a feast they had at their wedding! And the tiger ate whole platefuls of aloo tikki dipped in his now favorite fresh mint sauce. He wolfed down large quantities of bindi masala, also known as lady fingers or okra, and crispy dal doses, which are crepes made with fermented rice and lentil batter. The tiger man washed it all down with mugfuls of sweet elaichi chai, also known as cardamom pod tea. After the partying had died down, and after sleeping for the best part of a week. The tiger said to his bride, "Make yourself ready. It is time now to come and live with me, in my palace." But of course, he didn't really have a palace; only a den in the middle of the forest. He wasn't going to say that to her, because she wouldn't want to come with him, if she knew the truth. That she had married a tiger. In disguise. Now we are going to take a very brief break before continuing with the story. In the second part, we are going to learn what happened after the tiger married the Brahmin girl. Do you think they will make a happy couple? But first, Bertie is here to tell us about Storyworth, who are sponsoring this week's episode. Storyworth. They sound like a good partner for Story Nori, don't they? Absolutely, Jana. Story Worth and Story Nori. That really is a match made in heaven. Now, as it happens, my son Sasha is eleven years old this week, and as a gift, I'm signing him up for Story Worth. But Story Worth would make a great present for anyone of any age. So Story Worth is a kind of hybrid. It's an online service, but there's a physical paper book at the end of it. Every week, Storyworth will email Sasha with a thought-provoking question to get him writing. I can choose a question from suggestions by Storyworth, or I can make up my own. For example, I could ask Sasha, "If you could see into the future, what do you think you'd find out?" Or I might ask Sasha about what he's been drawing recently, because he's really into drawing and is having lessons. I could even ask him to describe a day at school and draw his teacher. After one year, Storyworth will compile all the stories, including photos, into a beautiful book. And when Sasha's grown up, his children can read all about how his life was when he was eleven years old. With Storyworth, I'm giving those I love most a thoughtful, personal gift from the heart, and preserving their memories and stories for years to come. Go to Storyworth.com/storynori. And save ten dollars on your first purchase. That's Storyworth. dot com forward slash Storynori to save ten dollars on your first purchase. Now back to Jana to find out about that tiger and that Brahmin girl. Thank you. Can't wait to hear how Sasha gets on with Storyworth. So, amid many tears and blessings from her parents, the tiger man and his bride. Left along the trail through the forest, he led the way, still in the form of a man. Towards the middle of the day, the girl begged her husband to stop so that she could rest her weary feet and eat some food that her mother had prepared for the journey. Have I married a weakling? 
growled her new husband. It is far too early to stop. Keep going. So the girl trudged wearily on. Soon she was hot and uncomfortable, and her feet were terribly sore. Please, dear husband, may we stop now? she pleaded. Not until I say so, he roared. And his face and his voice were so fierce that she did not dare argue. But eventually she was so exhausted that she sat down on a rock, unable to go on any longer. I don't care what you do, she said. I can't take another step. Get up, or I shall show you my true self, threatened her husband. Oh, go ahead replied his new wife. I do believe you've shown your true self to me already. You are not the noble soul you pretended to be to my parents. You are a cruel and hard-hearted brute. You are more right than you know, proclaimed her husband, who immediately turned back into a tiger, his true self. So terrified was the girl that she could not even let out a scream. She froze on the spot and the tiger dragged her to his den. In the morning he told her what she must do. She must cook for him. Only the finest Ayurvedic food, fit for Brahmins, and tigers. And he needed plenty of it, because tigers have big appetites. But what could the girl use for ingredients? She had to find leaves and herbs and berries and seeds. All day long she was gathering and cooking. Fortunately, the tiger only felt hungry about twice a week. But when he ate, he needed a huge dinner that took several days of cooking to prepare. His bride was as miserable as could be. She had been cheated into thinking she would lead a life of luxury and idleness. And here she was with a clump of grass for her pillow and doing nothing all day but work, work, work. Eventually, a crow took pity on the poor girl and said, If you tell me where your family lives, I shall carry a message to them and let them know that your husband has shown his true self to be a tiger of the forest, disguised by magic. Oh dear crow, thank you, thank you replied the girl. She explained where her village was and how to find her family's house. And he flew off with the message. The next day he saw the girl's brother going out of his door to the fields. The crow called down from a branch and said, Is that so? Said the brother angrily. I never trusted him. I tried to warn my parents, but they would not listen. I shall rescue her if you will show me the way to the tiger's den. I shall be glad to. 
said the crow. And off they set down the forest path, with the crow leading the way. When they had been going for about an hour, they came across a donkey who had wandered into the forest and lost his way. What luck! My sister hates to walk. This donkey's four feet will carry her, said the boy. So he took the donkey by the mane and led him along. It took them all day to reach the tiger's lair, and it was almost dark when they arrived. Oh, how overjoyed the girl was to see her brother, who had come to the rescue. You must be hungry, she exclaimed. Would you like some dal before we leave? The boy was indeed hungry after the long journey. But there was no time to eat because they heard the tiger pacing down the path. His tummy rumbling because he was hungry. The girl urged her brother and the donkey to hide themselves in the attic. It wasn't easy for the donkey to climb the steps, but fear is a great motivator. And terror of the tiger made his hooves more nimble than they had ever been. Soon they heard the tiger roar. Why, where's my supper? Okay, just a moment, dear, she replied, understandably terrified of the tiger. Unfortunately, the donkey was so frightened that his four knees were knocking together, and he was trembling so much that the whole house shook, and soon the ceiling collapsed. A huge container of roti atta which is a special flour used to make chapatis, fell down hard on top of the tiger's head and knocked him out cold. While they had the chance, the girl, the boy and the donkey ran for their lives back to the village. Sometime later, the tiger woke up, dazed and confused and covered in flour. Eventually, he realised what had happened and headed off down the path to the village. The family of Brahmins were delighted to see their beloved daughter, whom they had missed greatly. They soon prepared a welcoming feast. Just as they were sitting down to eat, the tiger returned in his human form. His wife began to tremble. Her parents, however, remembered their noble lineage. It would be shameful to turn away their son-in-law. And so they invited him to sit down at the table, which he did. It did not take long for the tiger man to gobble down most of the delicious food. After he had finished eating, he let out a few loud, satisfied burps, and then, as was his custom, lay down to sleep. Now the girl's brother was not going to let the tiger man take his sister back to the forest a second time. So in the night, when everyone else was asleep, he took a spade and dug a deep pit in the forest path. He finished digging at daybreak and covered the pit with thin sticks and branches so that it looked just like the path. As he suspected, when the tiger man awoke, he forced the girl to get up and head back to his den with him. Fortunately, the tiger man led the way. He did not reach far before his foot stepped on a weak branch over the hole and fell fell far down into the deep tiger trap and was unable to climb out. He roared angrily and turned back into his tiger form. Soon the village hunters came running 
And that was the end of him. The Brahmin's daughter was now a widow. After a suitable period of mourning for her husband had passed, she told her parents who she really wanted to marry. He wasn't rich or noble, and he certainly wasn't a tiger. He was a boy from the village. In earlier times, her parents would have declared him too low a match for a girl from a family of Brahmins. But now, after the experience with the tiger, all they wanted was for their daughter to be happy, which she was when she married her true love. She and her new husband cooked together and looked after each other with affection and kindness and delicious food for the rest of their lives. And that was the tale of the tiger who became vegan. I do hope you enjoyed this flavoursome story and perhaps are keen to try some Indian food now. It's not all vegetarian, by the way. If you do try some Indian food for the first time, be careful. Start with a mild dish. You don't want to burn your mouth on any hot chilies. Now, Bertie's off for an aubergine curry. His favourite. From me, Jana, at storynoi.com. Bye for now. The Dutch Hotel, Part 3, The Film Shoot Hello, this is Jana. Have you been following our new series, The Dutch Hotel? If not, catch up now. Here's a little recap. The Joneses family are going to manage a hotel in London. They keep on hearing stories that it's haunted. And Dad, whose name is Alan, has seen two dogs walk through a closed door at the stroke of midnight. None of the family slept particularly well for the rest of the night, if at all. In the morning, the kids were tired, but somehow relieved. At breakfast, they sat on cushions on the dining room floor and crunched their toast and marmite, trying not to make too many crumbs. At least we know now said Nafsi. There's no more doubt about it. They really do exist. What exists? asked Mum. Ghosts, of course, replied the kids in unison. You sure? Well, yes. Dad saw those two dogs walk through a door that was closed, said Yogi excitedly. Well, perhaps he was asleep and he dreamt it, said Mum with one of her little smiles. Dad, were you asleep? asked Nafsi. I, uh, I don't think so, replied Dad. Listen! Unexplained things happen sometimes, yeah? That doesn't mean there's no explanation. It just means we don't know what it is, Mum explained. But he did see them, and Heracles saw them too, said Nafsi indignantly. Mum was clearly annoyed that her children were learning to believe in ghosts. She flashed Dad one of her stares as if it was his fault, which perhaps it was. After all, he was the one who had brought them to this hotel.
On Monday morning, Dad walked the kids to school before returning to start his day's work. His first Zoom meeting was with two executives from the Public Relations Agency. They were responsible for making sure that the world knew that the Dutch hotel was reopening. Mum had to help him set up his Zoom call because in his previous job as a chauffeur, he did not have to do that sort of thing. The PR women were Petronella and Emily. Even though they were calling from their homes, they were dressed up with plenty of jewellery. Both of them were tanned as if they had just returned from the south of France, which they probably had. In fact, they might still be there for all Dad knew. In their well-paid jobs, they travelled often and stayed in luxurious hotels for free. But they had not yet experienced the Dutch hotel. Can you take us on a virtual tour? They asked. So Dad walked around the hotel with his phone showing them all the nooks and crannies. Oh, it's gorgeous, declared Petronella. Though a bit spooky without any guests or furniture. We're never lonely here, said Dad. There are plenty of ghosts here. Are you kidding? No, that's the reputation, said Dad. How absolutely fabulous, declared Emily. We can do a lot with the haunted hotel. It's a great marketing hook. Emily and Petronella were fast workers. It took them just ten days to set up the shoot with the photo and video production company. The hotel was still looking rather empty of furniture, but fortunately at least a few beds and some tables and chairs arrived just in time. You would have thought that these days you could do a lot with just a camera phone, but the PR company had a budget to spend and so they spent it. They arranged for a director, two camera operators, a makeup artist, a costume advisor, lighting and half a dozen models, three men and three women. Zelda, the hotel's owner, came to watch. After all, it was her money they were burning. The kids were at home because it was half term. In a spare moment, the makeup artist gave them spooky makeup with ghoulishly white faces and dark eyes, and scarlet blood dripping from their mouths. The models were dressed up in the styles of the 1920s. The women wore feathers in their hair, and their skirts had high waists and stopped just above the knee. If you've ever seen the film of The Great Gatsby or an Agatha Christie mystery, you'll know what I mean. They would have puffed cigarettes in long cigarette holders, but you can't do that these days. The men wore dinner suits with black bow ties or plus fours, which are kind of golf trousers. Where are the ghosts? asked Yogi, who now looked like a ghoul. Just a minute, called out a model who was still having his makeup done. He fitted some fake fangs in his mouth and stood up. He also wore spooky makeup and was wearing a cape. Yes, there was no mistake. He was Dracula. He posed by a marble fireplace with one of the female models, pretending to bite her neck. We'll add some more spooky stuff in post, explained the director. Can't you email it? asked Yogi. Post production happens after the filming is all done, explained Zelda. The filming and posing for still photos took all day. And there were plenty of costume changes and rearranging of the lighting in various rooms. It took about a week before Dad received the video and the photos from the PR agency in his email. The video gave a good overview of the hotel and included some shots of horse riding in Hyde Park. Welcome to traditional elegance in the heart of London. Said the voiceover as the camera opened up to show the lobby with all its impressive marble and alabaster. They featured a pair 
of models sitting at a dinner table looking refined and relaxed. The voiceover talked about the history of the hotel and the legend of the Dutch twins who had once owned it and who had fought a duel. Only at the end did the voiceover say, And if you call for room service this Halloween, you might meet a ghost. But don't worry, the spectres at the Dutch hotel always extend a warm welcome. What do you think? Asked Dad. A bit lame, said Yogi. Not much horror at all. Well, we don't want to frighten off the guests, do we? Said Mum. They didn't even show the vampire biting a girl, said Nafsi, disappointed. We've got a still image of that, said Dad, and he brought it up on the computer screen. We might use it in our Halloween advertisement. Any other scary stuff? asked Yogi. No, not really, said Dad. But just as he spoke, his phone began to sound. It was Zelda, the hotel owner. Alan here? He answered. Have you seen the shoot? She asked. Yes, we were just admiring the photos and the videos. Replied Alan. Did you notice anything unusual? No, not really. Said Alan. They'll check your email. I've just sent through another set of still images said Zelda. Alan looked on his computer. He opened up the photos. These ones were black and white. They showed the hotel looking quite full of guests and staff. And the tables in the restaurant were full of rich looking food. Some of the men were leaning back and smoking cigars. It's amazing what you can do in post, said Alan. It looks like a full house. The thing is said Zelda. None of those people were added in post. When our designer added a black and white filter to the colour photographs, all those people just appeared. You're kidding me. You know me, said Zelda. I never joke about business. When Dad put the phone down, Mum was fuming. Now this is getting quite silly. She said. Zelda is in on the scheme. She wants to spread the word the hotel is haunted to get publicity for the opening. All of you are just making this stuff up. But it's not on because it's frightening our kids. We're not scared, insisted Nafsi and Yogi. But Mum was not happy. And that was the third part of our series, The Dutch Hotel, read by me, Jana, for StoryNori.com. And before I go, here's Bertie with a short message. Hi, I hope you're enjoying our new series, The Dutch Hotel. If you do like StoryNori, you can always leave us five stars, please, and a nice review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you catch your podcasts. Right now, I'm here to tell you about a new podcast that Jana and I are launching ourselves. We've been very happy to give a little promotion to other podcasts who've been sponsoring Story Nori, and that's fantastic. But this is our own production. It's been a bit delayed because of a big family event. My 101-year-old mother passed away recently. And now that huge chapter has closed, we're ready to get started again on Relaxivity. And we're going to publish episodes every week. The Relaxivity podcast will be recognisably like Story Nori, but just a bit more grown up. For example, there will be plenty of ancient myths. We know you love myths. You're always on asking for them, but we can't always do them because they're just a bit too grown up for Story Nori. So now, older kids and adults will be able to hear them on Relaxivity. 
We're going to work through the whole of the metamorphosis by Ovid. When you've heard all of those stories, you'll be pretty well up on your classical mythology. And when you visit the art gallery, you will know exactly what's happening in those pictures, I guarantee. So tune into Relaxivity on Apple Podcasts, Google, Stitcher, Amazon, Podcast Addict, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. We're going to make this a really sophisticated, classy podcast that we think our older listeners who've grown up with Story Nori will really enjoy, and the parents too. It's really for you, the older members of the family. We just think you'll like it, because we like it. And so you don't forget, it's called a relaxivity, and it's published by Story Nori. You can even get it on the web at relaxivity.app, but it's in all good podcast catchers. So, all I'm going to say now is from me, Bertie, and from Jana, and from everyone who helps us at Story Nori, and that includes those aboard us on Patreon. We feel you're really part of our journey, so thank you very much. From everybody at Story Nori, Bye-bye for now. The Dutch Hotel, Part 2, Moving In Dedicated to Sophia and Henry, who support Story Nori on Patreon. Hello, this is Jana. And I've been feeling a bit spooked out recently. Because Bertie keeps on playing creepy music on his guitar. Ooh, spooky. I know what that means. Halloween must be coming soon, but just as importantly, we have a new series about a mysterious hotel in London. It's called The Dutch Hotel, and rumour has it that it's haunted. again, perhaps that's just an old story. The Jones family are going to move into the hotel and manage it. Just to recap their names, Dad is called Alan, Mum is Angeliki, and the kids are Nafsi and Yogi. So how would you feel about spending your first night in a reputedly haunted hotel. Would you be excited? Or a bit frightened? Listen on to find out. The family was moving home and that meant packing everything up. There were crates and boxes for all their precious belongings and a skip for all the junk they had collected over the years. The skip required some tough decisions. Do I really need to keep this doll that was once so beloved? Or this toy dumper truck that I played with when I was three years old? Probably not. But the guitar? Well, that's definitely coming with us. As for the furniture, nearly all of it went to Billy O'Ryan, the antique dealer. The hotel was going to have far grander beds and chairs than the Joneses ever sat or lay on in their little muse house. Though there were one or two pieces that had to come, like Dad's desk that he used for drawing and painting, which was his hobby, and he was not a bad artist either. Heracles, their miniature poodle, watched anxiously. He knew something was afoot and did not want to be left behind. When he saw his bed go into the back of the furniture van, he tried to jump in too. 
but it was too high for him. Since they were only moving a few streets away, it took just five minutes' drive to get there. The redecoration of the hotel was still not quite finished, but it was near enough for them to move in. They were taking a palatial suite of rooms on the fifth floor. The ceiling of the main room was a cupola, like in a church. All the rooms had marble fireplaces, deep panelled doors. The walls were decorated with white alabaster columns, and gold cornices ran around the tops. Oil paintings and watercolors, mainly of country scenes like pheasants and fox hunting, were hung all around. Wow! Said the kids. We're going to live like royalty. Heracles ran around excitedly, exploring the rooms. Once or twice, his claws skidded on the marble floors. But the furniture was still somewhat lacking. So the kids were going to sleep on inflatable mattresses on the floor. Not that they minded; it was more fun that way. Now here we must take a little pause for about one minute's time. I know I can't wait to find out if the kids see a ghost in their new home. But Bertie's told me that I'm not allowed to turn the page and look ahead. So hang on. While I tell you about an amazing new podcast from our sponsor, Wondery. Do you like parties? Yeah, I know I do. You wouldn't want to miss a great party, would you? Especially if it was in your own home. But what if every time you and your family went out through the front door, a great party was happening and you didn't even know about it? A new musical podcast from Wondery lets you into the secret. Melon is an eight-pound dog with a thousand-pound heart, and she and her friends party while their humans are away. Who are her friends? Well, lots of them are household objects with talent and singing voices. Each episode of Melon's House Party will keep you laughing and singing along. Melon's House Party is a musical adventure your family won't want to miss. Do you like the sound of that? I'm going to be singing along to Melon's House Party, and if you want to join in, here's what you have to do: follow Melon's House Party on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music. Or you can listen ad-free and one week early by joining Wondery Plus Kids in Apple Podcasts or Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Now, back to our story. Where was I? Ah,、oh, yes, the Joneses have just moved into their new home. A suite of rooms in the Dutch hotel, that some people say, is haunted. The Joneses haven't seen the evidence of ghosts, not yet, at any rate. After unpacking about half of their things, everyone was hungry. The hotel kitchen was not yet open, so Dad and the kids went out to buy fish and chips from their favourite shop in Paddington. The chips there were so famous that people came all the way from Notting Hill to collect them. How are you today? Asked Sunny, the fish and chip fryer. We're doing great, replied Yogi. We just moved into the Dutch hotel. It's going to be our new home. Oh, very nice, said Sunny. A bird from the ghost. Mum says the ghosts are just a wild story," said Nafsi. "I don't like to contradict your mum," said Sunny. "But I used to work in the kitchen of the Dutch hotel. Everyone who worked there will tell you that the ghosts are very real. 
Did you see one with your own eyes? asked Yogi. Yes, with my own eyes. He came into the kitchen, picked up a knife and chopped up potato chips. How did you know he was a ghost? Because I could see right through him. Until recently, the kids thought the idea of ghosts was an entertaining idea. But now the repeated warnings were starting to make them nervous. When Dad joked, Hey, perhaps we should buy a bag of chips for the ghosts. The kids did not laugh. In fact, they were rather quiet all the way back to their new home, which didn't seem like such an inviting place to live anymore. Don't worry, said Dad. Nobody has said the ghosts mean any harm. So do you believe in them now? Asked Nafsi. Listen. One, ghosts don't exist. Two, if ghosts do exist, they won't do us any harm. So they do exist, concluded Yogi. Uh, I didn't say that. But you almost did. The kids had been planning to play hide and seek around the hotel, but they cancelled that idea. It seemed safer to stay in their rooms. Mum helped them inflate their blow up beds with an electric pump, and they spread out their sleeping bags. For the moment, they just sat and watched a movie on Dad's laptop. Fortunately, it was a funny movie about a clever dog and did not feature any ghosts in it. When it was nearly bedtime, the family received a visitor. He was one of the few people who knew where they were. His name was Father Costas, and he was a Greek Orthodox priest. Mum had asked him to speak to the kids about ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts, Father Costas? asked Nafsi. I believe that some buildings are haunted by spirits. Mum's eyes widened. This was not the answer she had been hoping for. She was actually quite cross that he was reinforcing the idea of the supernatural. Dad noticed her expression. But the father did not, and he continued. Buildings have a history. And many things happen in them. There is a kind of atmosphere that lingers on. But do not worry, children. The Lord is watching over you and he will keep you safe. You can sleep well and you will be fine in the morning. What do you think happened in this hotel? asked Yogi. It's an old story. I can't say if it's true or not. But legend holds that this hotel was once owned by two Dutchmen, who were twin brothers. They both loved the same girl, and they fought a duel over her at the break of day in Hyde Park. Both of them fired their pistols at the same time and they killed one another. Ever since then, the hotel has been haunted. Or so they say. But, but are you sure that no innocent people have been hurt in this hotel? Asked Dad. Yes, I have never heard of anyone coming to any harm. In fact, I knew the former manager of this hotel quite well some 20 years ago. He said that the ghosts were always pretty helpful. The children felt a little reassured, not so much by the priest's words, but by his personality that was very calming. So they did manage to fall asleep. And they slept soundly until Heracles started barking. He was in the main room, and he would not stop. 
His barks got shriller and shriller. The kids heard Dad get up and go into the room to tell him to calm down. Then they heard Heracles whimpering. Dad, what's happening? Is is it a ghost? Called out Yogi. Dad did not answer. So the kids got up and very cautiously opened their bedroom door. It led directly into the main room. Dad was sitting on a bench by the window, with Heracles on his lap, shaking like a leaf. Dad was stroking the dog's curly head. What happened? You look like you've seen a ghost," said Mum, who had also arrived wearing her dressing gown. "You have seen a ghost, haven't you?" said Nafsi. "Was it a servant like the night watchman described?" "They, they, they weren't human at all. They were like a pair of greyhound dogs, and..." When I came into the room, I shooed them away, and they went through the door. Out into the corridor. Yes, but the door was closed. They went straight through it. Oh, said Yogi. So the ghosts are real then? I never thought I would say this, but I can only tell you. What a soul! With my own eyes. And that was the second part of our spooky story, the Dutch Hotel. How do you feel now that Dad has seen a pair of ghost dogs? Are his eyes playing tricks on him? It seems that Heracles was pretty spooked too. And I'm delighted to dedicate this story to Sophia and Henry. Their mum, Camilla, writes. I just wanted to let you know my kids, Sophia and Henry, love Story Nori. We couldn't get through our trips without it. The Katie stories are a big favourite, and we really enjoyed the Dutch Hotel as well. Can't wait to see what will happen next. Yay! I want to know what happens next too. Thank you so much, Sophia, Henry, and Camilla, for supporting Story Nori on Patreon. For now, from me, Jana. At storynori.com. Happy Halloween! Melon's house party. Hello, this is Jana. Do you like parties? Yeah, I know that I do. You wouldn't want to miss a great party, would you? Especially if it was in your own home. But what if every time you and your family went out through the front door, a great party was happening, and you didn't even know about it? A new musical podcast from Wondery lets you into the secret. Melon is an eight-pound dog with a thousand-pound heart, and she and her friends party while their humans are away. Her friends aren't just animals; they include objects around the house, like the couch and the wall calendar. They all come alive to sing and party. Do you like the sound of that? Well, here's an excerpt from Melon's house party, sent to us. 
by Wandry, who are kindly sponsoring this special episode. While you're listening, follow on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free and one week early by joining Wandry Plus Kids in Apple Podcasts or Wandry Plus in the Wandry app. Here's the excerpt from Melon's House Party. Hi, I'm Melon, a tiny dog, and this is my house. Didn't know when you're away, things in your house sing all day, and just so we're all clear, they sing in a key when they dogs here. My best friend Couch. Hi, I'm Couch. And all my friends talk. The couch, the bookshelf, and even the record player. Hey, Can we come to your house? Yeah. Oh, here you have a party. Oh, yeah. Can we come over now? Please do. It's a house party. From Wondery, this is Melon's House Party. And this episode's called Something New for the House. Honey, let's hit the road. The store's closing soon. Uh, do you have the keys? Sure do. <coughs> All right, Millen. <coughs> we'll be back soon with something new for the house. It's a surprise, and you're gonna look. <coughs> well, you might not love it. Huh? Be a good girl. <coughs> okay, you're gone. Here I come, couch. <coughs> All right, couch. Ready for the day? I'm locked, loaded, and very Couch, my tail is wagging so hard it could break at any moment. What do you think, Luke and Chloe, are going to bring us? Hopefully, it's something awesome. Ooh, like a never-ending bone. Ooh, or a dog sweater that matches my upholstery. Ooh, or an automatic belly rubber that doubles as a pillow fluffer. Ooh, or a cute ottoman that I can treat like a baby and raise as my own. It has to be one of those. Well, that wore me out. I gotta take a nap. Melon, are you awake? Melon! Melon, wake up! Huh? I just had a nightmare. You know that thing our human parents are bringing home? Ooh, what if it's an edible leash? Well, that'd be tight. I mean, obviously. But what if it's something we don't like? Or even worse, what if it's something we hate? Luke said you're gonna love it. Yeah, but then Chloe was like... She might not love it. Oh, right. She did say that. Oh! Sorry to interrupt. It's me, Rita Records, the record player. Now everyone, pay attention! Good morning, everyone. I'm the wall calendar. It is a great pleasure to have this press conference on the eve of one of the most packed weeks we've had in recent history. Yes, the weekly... Maybe Wall Calendar knows what Luke and Chloe are bringing home. In fact, there are even events uncomfortably squeezed into my margins. Okay, let's get started. Was that fun or what? I'm going to be singing along to Melon's house party. And if you want to join in, here's what you have to do. Be sure to follow Melon's house party on Apple Podcasts or Amazon Music. And you'll hear the rest of this episode as well as new episodes. For now, from me, Jana, at storynori.com, keep partying!
The Dutch Hotel, Part One. The Job with a Snag. Dedicated to Sophia in Montana, whose family kindly supports Story Nori on Patreon. Hello, this is Jana, and welcome to the start of a brand new original series here on Story Nori. Our stories, like Wicked Uncle, Astro Papa and Katie, are always amongst our most popular. We hope you are going to enjoy this new series just as much. It's going to be read by me, Jana, and it's written by Bertie, of course. It's set in central London around Hyde Park and Paddington, places that Bertie knows really well. So. Expect lots of authentic details. It's about a London hotel called the Dutch Hotel. There's something special about the hotel. Can you guess what it is? Well, I'll give you a clue. We're launching this series in the run-up to Halloween. So if you like spooky stories. You are going to love this new series. I could tell you more, but why waste time? Let's get going with the story. The Dutch Hotel. The Joneses lived in central London in a muse house. You can find muse houses down little side streets that run behind the big houses. Once upon a time, they were stables or garages with living quarters for the servants on the upper floor. Nowadays, they are expensive and fashionable homes, smallish but pretty. You might even find a film star living in a muse house. The Joneses were not rich. Dad, whose name was Alan, was a chauffeur. His boss, Harry Harrington, was a very wealthy man. He had made tons of money in property, houses and hotels and the like. His name appeared in the rich lists in the Sunday newspapers. Dad had worked for Harry Harrington for years. In the early days, he had been a messenger boy, but Dad loved cars and was good with mechanics. So Harry made him his chauffeur. Any time, night or day, he was ready to take Harry and his latest and ever younger wife to wherever they wanted to go, near or far. On normal days, they rode in the Mercedes. On Sundays and special occasions, they took the Rolls Royce. But when Harry Harrington died, aged ninety-one, his grown-up children did not want a chauffeur. They preferred to race around in their sports cars, revving up the engines down little streets, and making pedestrians jump out of their way. But they did want the Muse House, because it was valuable. And so it seemed that Dad was out of a job, and the Joneses were going to be homeless. Alan's wife Angeliki worked as an administrator in a hotel. But did not make nearly enough money to pay for a house in central London. At first, the children weren't too worried. They had a natural optimism that everything would work out one way or another. Don't worry, Dad," said Yogi, who was eleven years old. "We are good people, and nothing bad will happen to us." But the more they saw their parents looking anxious and tired. The more the kids caught the worry bug. It turned out that the kids' first instinct was the correct one. Although Harry Harrington's numerous sons and daughters seemed indifferent to their fate, there had been one other important person in his life. Zelda, his seventh and final wife, had inherited a good part of his fortune. And invited him to come and see her, to discuss his future. Alan, my husband really loved you," she said as she sunk into the deep sofa. She sat across from him, holding a bone china teacup. 
He always said that he trusted you with his life. I think it is terrible that his children are throwing you on the scrap heap like a used car. Alan knew there was bad feeling between Zelda and Harry's children. Their differences were about money. Differences usually are. Alan nodded and said, Well, it does seem a bit harsh, especially on my kids. Do not worry. I have a very special job for you. Do you know the Dutch Hotel? I know most of the hotels in London, but I don't believe I've seen that one, said Alan. Well, it is a very beautiful building in Lancaster Gate. Maybe it has seen better times, but the location is perfect, don't you think? Alan, of course, knew where Lancaster Gate was. It was near where he lived. It wasn't exactly Mayfair where the best known hotels were, but it was close to Hyde Park and convenient for the sights of London. He nodded. So, I would like you to be manager of this hotel. And of course you can live there with your family. Alan was really taken aback. He had never done anything like manage a hotel, but at least his wife, Angeliki, worked in one. Well, Angeliki knows more about hotels than I do, he admitted. And I suppose we could work together. It can't be rocket science. You are right. It is not rocket science, said Zelda. The most important thing is that I can trust you. That is what matters to me in this world right now. But there is one special feature about this hotel which I must tell you about. I could let you find out for yourself, but that wouldn't be fair. Special feature? I can hear Harry talking when you say that. I know what you really mean is that there's a problem, and uh, not a small one. You are right, said Zelda. I have picked up Harry's way of talking, yes. There is a problem that you need to know about. Which is? The Dutch Hotel is haunted. What do you mean, haunted? Well, there are ghosts there. Really? Yes, really. Perhaps you don't believe in ghosts, but I promise you that you will soon. I have stayed in this hotel. That is why I believe in them. But don't worry too much. They are mostly friendly. So, now I have told you the good, the bad and the ugly. What will be your decision? Will you take the job? I'll have to speak to my wife, Angeliki. But I don't think we have many choices right now, so I expect the answer will be yes. Angeliki was from a Greek Cypriot family. She was strong-willed, efficient and no-nonsense. But she had a big heart. What, you mean I must give up my job? She exclaimed when Alan told her the plan. Yes, but we can live in the Dutch hotel and have a share of the profits on top of our salaries. It solves all our problems. Uh, there's just one thing. Um, the hotel's haunted. Ha! said Angeliki. Don't worry about that. All hotels are haunted, but you won't see any ghosts. What's it like, this building? Well, let's go and take a look, said Alan. It's only a few streets away. So, what do you think? Will Alan take the job? And will the Joneses move into the Dutch hotel that might be haunted? Well, you won't have to wait long to find out, because I'm going to continue the story in about a minute's time. So don't go away. But first, here's some news about a great new musical podcast you should check out. It comes from our sponsor, Wondery. 
Melon's House Party is a new musical podcast for the whole family to enjoy together. Sing along with Melon, an eight-pound dog with a thousand-pound heart, and her friends as they have a party while their humans are away. At Melon's house party, all the objects in the house can sing, from the couch to the fridge. It's so great that you will want to sing too. This is one party you won't want to miss. Everyone here at Story Nori loves animals and loves singing, so of course we're going to be following Melon's musical adventures, and I'm going to be voting for Melon when she runs for mayor of her dog park. I hope Melon can count on your vote too. Listen to Melon's house party on Amazon Music. Apple Podcasts, or you can listen ad-free and early right now by subscribing to Wondery Plus Kids in Apple Podcasts or Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. So back to our story. Let's find out if the Joneses are going to move into the Dutch hotel. Although it wasn't far, they decided to put on their best clothes and take the Rolls Royce. There was nothing like creating a good first impression, and besides, Alan wouldn't have many more opportunities to drive his beloved car. Daddy, can't you ask Zelda if you can keep it? Asked Nafsi, his daughter. Well, perhaps. Said Alan. But it does use a lot of petrol, and I'll have to pay for it now. Who cares? Said Yogi. We're going to own a hotel. We're going to be rich. No, no, not quite. <laughs> said Alan. We're going to manage a hotel. It still belongs to Zelda. Oh, same difference. Said Yogi. They pulled up outside the Dutch hotel. It was a tall, impressive building on a corner. The windows were large and ornate, and the doors were inviting. But there was no attendant, and nobody to greet the car. It doesn't look open," said Angeliki. "Let's go and see," urged Nafsi. They all got out of the rolls and went to peer through the glass front door. Those are builders inside," said Angeliki. The hallway was grand enough, with plenty of marble, tiles, and pillars. But there were sheets on the floor, and some men were putting up wallpaper. Let's go inside," said Yogi. Alan was in a bolder than usual mood. He pushed the door, and it opened. Um. Hello," said Angeliki to one of the men. "Zelda Harrington said we could come and take a look at the building. She wants us to run the hotel." "I don't know about that. You can talk to Marek." Marek was in charge of the builders. He gave the family yellow hard hats and took them on a tour of the first couple of floors. "It's uh, nearly ready," he said. We've been working on it for the best part of a year. It was true. Most of what was happening now was finishing touches, like painting and laying carpets. The hard hats hardly seemed necessary. It's looking great. Said Alan, admiring the high ornate ceilings, the bronze stair rails, and the little statues. They went into a suite of rooms. It was twice as expansive as their house. Can this be our bedroom? Asked Yogi. Angeliki explained. Well, we're probably going to live here. Well, good luck," said Marek. It's a grand building, but you couldn't pay me enough to live here. Why is that? Asked Angelica. Because it's well. And truly 
haunted. Great! Great! Chimed the kids. We'll have the best Halloween parties. You might say great, but you'll be lucky if you have any restful nights. Uh, you should hear the stories the night watchmen come up with. In fact, Big Stu, the night watchman, will be on duty soon. You can hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. They didn't have to wait long. Big Stu, the night watchman, turned up about ten minutes later, clutching his flask of tea. Big Stu was actually quite small. His nickname was clearly a joke. But he did look wiry and tough, and certainly not the type to be easily frightened by some tall, spooky story. Stu, said Marrick, these nice people are, are thinking of living and working here when we've done the refurbishment. Can you scare some sense into them with your best ghost stories? Yay, we like scary stories, said Yogi. Aye, well, you've come to the right place, said Stu. I have here in front of me a bank of video monitors. They show me the corridors and the stairways and the nooks and the crannies of the hotel. Now it's closed. There is not supposed to be anyone wandering around in the wee hours of the morning, do you agree? It should be empty. True, <laughs> true. But here's the thing. When the clock touches the cusp of midnight, the monitors fill up with shades of people going about their business. What do you mean by the shades of people? asked Nafsi. I mean they look like people, but they can't be, because no one's supposed to be there. What sort of people? I would say for the most part they are servants, maids and waiters, fetching and carrying and sweeping and cleaning and the like. But there are guests too, ladies and gentlemen, dressed up to the nines in the fashions of years gone by. Oh, that's so spooky. Can we see videos of them? asked Yogi. So, <laughs> that's the thing. Every night I, I watch the shades, as I call them. They're as real as you are right now. But when I play back the video recordings, there's neither a soul nor a mouse, living or dead, to be seen. Now, are you frightened? One look at Mum's face showed that she wasn't scared a little bit. There was a tiny little smile at the end of her lips which revealed that she was slightly amused by the ghostly tale and did not believe it. But Dad looked more concerned. Thank you for sharing your story, he said. We'll have to hope that the ghosts are harmless. As far as I know, they never did anyone in their beds. Not yet, at any rate, said Stu. When the family were gathered safely in the Rolls Royce, Nafsi asked, Daddy, are you sure you want us to live in that creepy hotel? Well, said Dad, where else can we live? And that was the first episode of the Dutch Hotel. Was that spooky enough for you? Do you want it to get more spooky? Well, Let's see if we can turn up the spooky factor in time for Halloween. And I'm delighted to dedicate this story to Sophia. Her dad, Mike, writes, Hello, Prince Bertie. Thank you and all the wonderful storytellers at Story Nori. My daughter Sophia, age nine, and I live in beautiful Missoula, Montana, and we have been enjoying listening to you all for several years now. Sophia is particularly fond of Katie the Ordinary Witch stories. I thought the Peer Gint stories were exceptional. 
We both love learning about the folk tales and legends from cultures around the world as well. Sophia encouraged me to support Story Nori on Patreon. Well, thank you so much, Sophia and Mike. That's fantastic. From me, Jana. Tune in soon at StoryNori.com for the next spooky episode of the Dutch Hotel. How the Jellyfish Lost His Bones Dedicated to Thomas in Australia whose family support us on Patreon. Hello, this is Jana. I don't know about you, but I'm not very keen on jellyfish. When I'm splashing about in the sea, I wouldn't like to bump into one of them in case it stings me with its tentacles. But on the other hand, if you can get a good look at the jellyfish in an aquarium, you can see that they are in fact a very interesting looking creature. They're translucent, which means that the light can shine through them. Some jellyfish even produce their own light, like lamps in the sea. And did you know that a jellyfish has no brain, heart, bones or eyes? but it does have a big mouth to eat its food. And it squirts water out of its mouth to propel it forward like a jet. So those are a few facts about the amazing jellyfish. What I am going to tell you now is an old folktale from Japan that explains how the jellyfish came to be the way he is now. Obviously, it's just a story, but as we all know here on Story Nori, stories can be just as fun as facts. Once upon a time, the jellyfish was a very handsome fellow. His appearance was beautiful and round as the full moon. He had glittering scales and fins and a tail as other fishes have. But he had more than these. He had little feet as well, so that he could walk upon the land as well as swim in the sea. What a jolly character he was! He was the most beloved and trusted servant of the Dragon King, who ruled the sea from his underground palace. In spite of all his good fortune, his grandmother always said that the jellyfish would come to a bad end because he would not study his books at school. She was right, and I can't wait to tell you how the silly jellyfish became the lump of jelly that we now know today. Now, as I was saying, the jellyfish was the most trusted servant of the underwater Dragon King. The magnificent Dragon King had recently married a beautiful dragoness, and he was madly in love with her. But unfortunately, the Dragon Queen fell ill. The doctors dosed her with every medicine that was known to them. But still, she did not get any better. The Dragon King was fearfully worried for his wife, and when he saw the doctors shaking their heads in dismay, he became even more worried. He knelt beside her bed and said, My heart's desire, I would give my life for you. A lot of good that would do me, she replied. But here's something useful you can do. Fetch me the liver of a monkey. When I eat it, I know I will feel quite better. It's a cure my grandmother told me about years ago. But light of my eyes, said the Dragon King, our kingdom is under the sea and monkeys live on the land in the forest how could i find a monkey liver tears ran down the lovely face of his young wife as she implored 
If you love me as much as you say you do, you will find a way to give me monkey liver, or else I shall surely die, and it will be all your fault. My sweet, my sweet, I shall find a way, I promise, declared the Dragon King. He immediately went to his court, where he summoned his trusted adviser, the jellyfish. You must fetch me the liver of a monkey, he declared. My wife's life depends on it. If she does not eat monkey liver soon, she shall die. My lord, said the jellyfish, where am I to find the monkey liver? I don't believe I've seen such a thing. They say that monkeys live in the tall trees of the forest, said the Dragon King to the jellyfish. Go and fetch me one if you honour me as much as you say you do. My lord, your wish, of course, is my command, replied the jellyfish, not at all happy with his impossible mission. The jellyfish set out on a long journey. He swam and he swam to the edge of the wide blue sea. And then he was in luck. He found a place where the forest came right down to the edge of the sea and the branches of the trees hung over the waves. And lo and behold, sitting on a branch, he saw a monkey. (laughs) Mr. Monkey, called out the jellyfish. How do you do? I'm all right called back the monkey. How are you? Indeed. Who are you? I don't believe we've met before. I am the jellyfish and I am advisor to his magnificence, my lord, dragon king, lord of the sea, replied the jellyfish grandly. Oh, that's very nice. And how is his majesty doing? asked the monkey politely. I doing just fine, replied the jellyfish. In fact, every day in Dragonland is a wonderful day. It's a rich and happy place, never short of food or drink, and we spend all our time singing and dancing and playing with the mermaids. Sounds nice, said the monkey. I'd like to visit such a place. Now the jellyfish was more than happy with this response. He believed that he had found a pretty stupid monkey who was falling for his tricks and lies. And so he called out obligingly. No problem. I have a strong, broad back. Just jump down from the tree and I shall carry you to the wonderful land of the dragons where every day is a play date. Thank you, said the monkey, and he jumped down onto the jellyfish's back. Of course, you remember that in those days the jellyfish had strong bones and could carry a weight if he wanted to. Well, he soon swam out into the middle of the sea with the monkey on his back. And he was so pleased with himself that he started to chuckle. (laughs) I like a good joke, said his monkey passenger. Can you share it with me? I'm laughing, said the jellyfish, because my lord, the dragon king, sent me to fetch a monkey so that his wife could eat his liver. And you (laughs) believed all my tricks. And now we're in the middle of the waves and you have no choice but to come with me and give your monkey liver to the queen. Oh dear, said the monkey as he looked at the waves and the distant shoreline. That is a pity, because I didn't bring my liver with me. I left it hanging out to dry in the persimmon tree where you found me. We shall have to go back and fetch it. Well, thank you for letting me know, 
said the jellyfish, turning around. And he swam back to the land so that the monkey could fetch his liver. But of course, when they reached the shoreline and the trees, the monkey hopped off the jellyfish's back and bounded.